What's going on, everybody? Welcome to WWE Aftershock. Uh, I'm Owen the Birdman Finch, and I'm here with uh, the co-host, the person that has been on almost every week, uh, hasn't missed a week. Um, by the way, this is week 37. I, I, I looked it up, and I even forgot to say what week it was. I didn't even forget. I just forgot. But anyhow, uh, this is uh, Chris Starr making his epic return to a full week of uh, content with you. Uh, how are you doing today, Chris? Splendiferous. Wow, I don't know if uh, that sounds good. So hopefully that's a good thing. But we're only uh, only we know. So well, actually only he knows type of thing. So, um, and then we have Mick and his epic return to WWE AfterShock for the first time since January. Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say where he went just because uh, you know uh, it's private. But uh, you know he claims he's the real world champion of WWE AfterShock. Uh, slash Wrestling Rundown, slash whatever prediction show we do the thin for. Uh, he's Rockland Rampage. He has, he's had so many nicknames on the show that it, it's so hard to keep track of. Uh, Stephen Coakley, how are you today? And Are you happy to be back, or are you indifferent on it? Or did you hate the fact that you're back? I feel super califragilisticexpialidocious about being back, is how I feel. And I am the real champion, so much so that every belt I see, I have to draw an X on it. Because for some reason, that makes me feel important, but it also makes me want to beat up anybody whose father may have been on 90210. Who knows why? Well, there you go. So, yeah, you're, uh, you're back. Uh, we ho we're hoping, too, that you're going to be back uh, at least full-time-ish type of thing. Just because, you know, now we've, able we've been able to work around uh, your schedule now, obviously. Uh, yeah. In hindsight, we probably could have just done the show at this time all along, and you would you wouldn't have had to disappear for so long. But you know, we live and learn type of thing. Chris had a whole week off. Chris pretty much had a whole week to do a retro, and we didn't realize it until uh, right before we started this video. So you know, you right. live and learn type of thing. Good thing we're good thing we're not doing this for a living because we'd be, we'd really uh, yeah we'd really suck at it. So um, you know. But yeah, we're gonna break down all of the weekly WWE content, which is gonna be different for Steve because he hasn't he hasn't said anything uh, currently about wrestling. I think uh, the last video I think you did was like a retro. I think it was WrestleMania 10. So uh, you know, we're gonna cover all of the weekly WWE shows. We're gonna start with Raw. Actually, we're gonna make a call. We're gonna start with main events. Just cause we're gonna follow house show rules since main event is uh, taped first. Just so they, just to get that out of the way. Let me find my notes for Thank God. Event. Um, okay. So, main event was taped Monday, but it actually aired, uh, uh, September 19th, 2023. But if you watch it on Hulu, it wasn't on Hulu until the next day. I don't know why they do it that way, but this is how they do it. Um, and then, you know, if you watch it via Peacock, you're not going to see main event for, like, a month. So, you know, it's, it's just how they do things. Um... We had the commentary team of Byron Saxon and uh, Wade Barrett on commentary. I thought they did fairly well on commentary together. I mean, Byron Saxon still not really much of a play-by-play -play guy on commentary. I kind of hope they can get somebody new to fill that role. But you, you know. know, Byron Saxon just isn't much of a guy. <laughs> yeah, he's not a locker room guy. He's not much of a out there guy. It is what it is. It is what it is. Uh, we had two matches. Uh, the first one was uh, Bronson Reed versus Riddick Moss. Uh, pretty decent match here. I don't really think the styles really worked well to together. Uh, their styles really don't really fit the, you know, because obviously Bronson Reed's a big guy, so Riddick Moss can't really do any of his power moves to him, and uh, Riddick Moss isn't the best seller, so, you know, uh, Bronson Reed wasn't able to sell his stuff. Uh I think the match went a little bit too long for my liking. I think this should have been a squash, but obviously because they had to fill the time for main events, they had to uh, make this a little bit more competitive. 
Uh, Riddick Moss did get some decent offense in. He does do, like, a really good fall-away slam onto Bonson Weed, I guess, which is decent. But then afterwards, uh, Bonson Weed pretty much destroys him after that. He hits the tsunami on him. And because Wade Barrett's on commentary now, I love hearing him call that now just because of how into it he gets. I'm wondering if that's one of the reasons they put him on Raw, so that way he could call that. Um, yeah, so that, that was just kind of that. I can't really... Uh, I was about to have you throw it to you guys to give opinions on it, but you really can't because you didn't see this match. So, uh, there you go. And then we have the main... Yeah. You know, well, unless, you, unless, we do, unless there's a retro for this in a year's time. So I think, uh, uh, we, I think we will see Riddick Moss as well as Emma being released soon if all these uh, cuts are true. Yeah, we'll He's be talking... To, yeah, we'll talk about that soon. And then we had the main event of main events... Um, I wonder if you get a big payday if you main event, main event, because, you know, they always say if you win the main event, you get a big payday, and, you know... But if you get less money... That'd be funny. Um... You know what it is? You get more money, but then the wrestling thug Brad Maddox shows up and steals it. <laughs> you're still trying. To, you're still trying to get that over. You got. You got your wrestling thug already. You know. Ten need... years. I don't think it's ever happened. No, no, no. You see, Brad Maddox is the wrestling thug. Don Mysterio is like the wrestling mug. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, what kind of mug? Because there's two versions of it. The mugs like that you drink coffee out of, or the mugs like that you that steal stuff and all that type of stuff. But yeah, he's a wrestling pug. He's a dog. <laughs> okay, yeah, he does look like he does look very doggish. Oh, so oh, he is a piece of shit. So I mean, it's it's kind of like yeah, piece well, of shit. Ooh, perhaps. Um, the, but yeah, we had the main event. It was the Viking Raiders versus Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. This was Cedric Alexander's and Shelton Benjamin's first match in WWE in a long time. I don't know where they went. I guess they just didn't have any plans for them, so they just. Really, Kings have made events forever. I know. Yeah. This is the first appearance on main event since, I think, uh, yeah, I don't even know how long. I think back in May, I think they were in, like, a battle royal on Raw for the IC title, and then they just disappeared forever. Um, you know, Shelton Benjamin is really an example of false advertisement. They really just need to change his theme to, yes, there is stopping me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad that's not... <laughs> the too bad uh, they can't really do that anymore. But anyhow, uh, this match though was very good though. You know, uh, both these teams really went all out type of thing. And eventually, uh, the Viking Raiders win with the uh, Viking Experience. No, not the Viking Experience. The Radnorock. That's the finisher. You no, know? uh, they hit that on uh, Cedric Alexander for the win. And uh, yeah, Viking Raiders win. I thought overall this was very entertaining, very good. I assume this was changed. I imagine the Viking Raiders were supposed to do something on Raw, but they had to change the writing, obviously, because uh, you know the big storyline they have going on with them right now. One of the participants wasn't there for it, so that's why I think they weren't there. Because it does it does seem a little odd that they uh, beat uh, Mick Riddle. Um, last week, and then they just move on main event to this week, but, you know, I'm gonna give them a... I'm supposed to be on the show, but they moved yeah. to the main event because of Vince. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh. there you go. So, that makes more sense. Um, but, yeah, overall, relatively, uh, decent episode. I'll give it main event. I'll give it, like, a C-plus, mainly for the Viking Raiders, uh, Cedric Alexander, uh, Shelton Benjamin tag match, so, you know, it's relatively decent stuff. Uh, now let's cover more. Um... Yeah, Raw well, took place on September 11th, 2023. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a very significant Raw because, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, the anniversary of 9-11 and everything like that. Uh, yeah. we, had the we had the commentary team of Wade Barrett and Michael Cole. Uh, it showed the intro. This is like the second week they've shown this new intro. Uh, I, I only put it back in the notes this week just because you guys haven't been on since they changed the intro up. Overall, I think the intro, uh, the new one... It's fairly good. It's the same song and everything, but obviously they've changed like the superstars that are in it. What do you guys think of the new intro? Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs in the middle? I kind of like it. I mean, it's it's whatever. It's an intro, but it's not terrible at least. Yeah, yeah it's an intro. I like. I don't hate the new music, but obviously I think there's a lot of uh, older raw intros that were a lot more pump you up. Definitely. I can't. I have to keep remembering too, not to add, not to say thumbs up, thumbs down, because Steve can do that, but because Chris doesn't go on camera, he can't really do a thumbs up or thumbs down. I mean, he can. We just won't even know. We just won't know what he's doing. They'll just have to like tell us type of thing. So, um, you know, it's. But uh, the law kicked off. Uh, Jey Uso come out to cut a promo, and the crowd's really into Jey Uso. Uh, the, the thing that Chris and I love the fact is the thing that got over was basically. 
I, uh, the wave that he does now, that everybody's into it now, no matter where they go, which I think is absolutely awesome. And, yeah. um... Yeah, uh, I think before he can really say anything, uh, he gets cut off by Kevin Owens. This was his first appearance since uh, the, he lost the tag titles. Um, and Kevin Owens talks about how uh, Jey Uso, he knows what Jey Uso is going through because he's had to be in this position before where uh, he's done all these dastardly things to people and he had to try to make up for it type of thing. And he said that there's something, you know, he can't really take back what he did. And, you know, for the most part... Uh, you know, a lot of people still kind of, you know, resent me for it and all that type of stuff. And he talked about how, you know, Sami Zayn may be able to forgive him after everything that they went through. But he's Kevin Owens is in the same vote as other people. He just really can't forgive him just because of all the stuff the bloodline did to him. And yeah. he, he's going to have to really make up for it. And uh, Judgment Day come out. And they still offer a spot for... Um, Jey Uso to join Judgment Day. Uh, he said that he can, you know, be hot, part of a new family. And he said that the beauty about this uh, is that there's no leaders in Judgment Day. Everybody is all equals. So, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't have to even worry about, you know, a power struggle or anything like that. And um, it's revealed that uh, Judgment Day was supposed to face Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, but Sami Zayn's not there. I don't know where he was, but he just wasn't there. Um, but, um... Probably getting Jey his elbow. Yeah, he could have been doing that. Uh, yeah. But Jey Uso offers to step up and be his tag team partner. And uh, we have that tag team match. Uh, it's a very good, very exciting tag team match. Uh, I thought it was absolutely uh, great stuff. Eventually, Jey Uso goes for a super kick on Finn Balor, and he inadvertently hits uh, Kevin Owens. And obviously, he's got this look on his face like he realized he screwed up. But, uh... Damian Priest hits a uh, South of Heaven, sending Jey Uso to the outside. And um, and I make it sound like he chokes. He did that outside the win. He, like, hit it on him in the win, and Jey Uso just rolled out type of thing. It's not like he hit it on the outside or anything like that. Um, yeah. And then uh, Finn Balor hits the uh, Wushu dropkick in the corner, followed by the coup de grace on Kevin Owens for the win. And Judgment Day win. I like this. I thought this all made a lot of sense, you know, uh... This makes it look like, you know, the G.U. show still can't be trusted. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a good uh, book of decision and everything like that to uh, do all of this. And, you know, uh, I thought all of this, uh, you know, was two thumbs up right here. So, uh, Chris, what did you think of this match overall? And how do you feel about how, how everything's going for G.U. So do you think he's going to earn anybody's trust? Uh, I like this match. It was really, it was a very, it was a really good opener. Um... Yeah, I think I, I think eventually he's going to earn the trust of, of, of most of the baby faces in the locker room that he beat up at one point in time. Uh, but my favorite part of this entire thing was when uh, that little piss ant got kicked in the face. That was my favorite part. That was good, yeah. And was anytime good. Dominic was here, was in pain is a good time. It's a great time. I love it. I love that he's in pain. But yeah, Steve... Yeah. Uh, your thoughts about first big thing you're reviewing WWE Currents you're gonna make this count what did you think think of this um, I've been thinking for a while just like far much earlier in the year looking forward to Survivor Series like if someone said alright you gotta pick two teams who's going against each other I was like oh that's easy it has to be Judgment Day Bloodline and now obviously the storylines have kind of gotten mixed up now where Judgment Day can easily be in a Survivor Series match, but the bloodline's all separated now. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit, you know, we start to see Sol Soko is obviously getting annoyed that Roman's part-timing SmackDown. Yep. Uh, Jimmy and Jay are split up. I could see a storyline where the bloodline are just picking apart, the, the bloodline getting picked apart by the Judgment Day individually to the point where Roman's like, all right, one match together, one more match. We have to work together and just to beat Judgment Day at Survivor Series, and then that's it. Yeah, I would like that. It'd be great. It's going to be War Games. And I think the story you can tell there is that Priest has the Money in the Bank briefcase, so Roman does need to take them seriously. Yeah, I think that'd be a good story. Because that would be that would get David Priest. Uh, into the babyface world really fast, because obviously that's the long-term goal out of all of this anyway. See, that's so. the thing is, I think it would make Roman more of a babyface than Priest. I think people hate Judgment Day way more than Bloodline. Yeah, so they, that... 
Especially since Dom's in it too, so you know that's, that that, yeah. that adds a reason. Although, but overall, do you think of the match itself? So, I thought the match was good overall. You know, solid performance by everybody. There you go. Then Kevin Owens is backstage. Jay comes up to him and tries to apologize for uh, what happened. And uh, Kevin Owens just isn't hearing this. He just basically tells him, you know, if you're going to go mope, go mope to the uh, bloodline or the Judgment Day. Because he just doesn't want to hear this anymore. So, overall, relatively great performances by uh, Kevin Owens. Uh, and then it shows Imperium arriving. Um, I thought something was going to happen here, but it just shows him showing up. This was the first time we see Walter in a shoot, so that was awesome. And then we had the 9-11 video package, which is obviously very sad to see, but, you know, you got to know the history type of thing, so, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, Steve, what do you think yeah. of all these segments right here? You know, it's always uh, a rough day for America, 9-11. Always has been. It's a tough day. But, um, you know, it's for Walter to try and uplift the mood a bit. You know, I'm, I'm just waiting for Vince to be like, you know what, kid? We're going to change your name again. From now on, you're just going to be Walt. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I, 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 this is gonna start calling him Walt. Yeah, and then what did you think of the Kevin Owens backstage segment? I thought it was good, and you know, no surprise there. Kevin Owens obviously doesn't trust anybody, so there's no reason he'd give Jay the benefit of the doubt. But Sami Zayn's gonna be a different story. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to wait and see when he gets into it. Uh, Chris, what did you think of all those segments right there? Um. I thought they were good. I liked the video package for 9-11. It's really a uh, touching tribute. And uh, Kevin Owens is just a rock star. No matter what he does, he can make he can make everything great. Uh, he's really he's clicking on also he's really firing on all cylinders right now. And he has no reason to trust Jay. Like he's beat the crap out of him for four years. Like why should he trust him right now? I know. And he's kicked him in the face again. So why why, why should he trust him? Yeah, it's it's interesting. So, um, then we had uh, the Miz versus Akira Tozawa. Um, before this, Miz cuts a promo saying that he's going to make an example out of Tozawa tonight, showing that you know uh, the match with LA Knight was nothing more than a fluke on at Payback. They have a match. Tozawa gets in a little offense, but then eventually Miz just destroys him. He hits, he lays him out with uh, two skull crushing finales, and uh, he just destroys Tozawa here. And, uh, yeah, that was basically it. Uh, overall, relatively good stuff to, you know, build the Miz back up a little bit again. Uh, sucks for Tozawa. It seems like no matter what this guy does, he just can't buy a win. He, he seems to lose all the time, whether that's Raw, Main Event, or Level Up. He's in this Heritage Cup tournament, and we'll talk about it. He was just mainly the Fall guy, so everyone could get points, pretty much. Mo most of his matches just were on Level Up, too. He couldn't even get on NXT for most of these matches. So poor Tozawa, man. But anyhow, uh, Chris, what did you think of this match and everything like that? Um, it's good to see, you know, Tozawa back on TV again. Um, he's a very versatile, uh, competitor that WWE has, but, uh, in terms of, like, the match, it was, a ne it was nothing. It was just to get the Miz over, um, again, making him look strong after a couple of, uh, couple of losses, uh, after the big loss at Payback to LA Knight, so he needed his win back after he lost to Tozawa. And, um, yeah, it wasn't bad. Steve? So, I'm kind of starting to look at some of these matches from the other angle of, like, yeah, I think everyone knows Tozawa is underappreciated. Like, no shocker there, but I'm starting to look at it and be like, is The Miz, like, going to get another big, I mean, real big main event love storyline, or is he just kind of going to be there now? He's going to be up there in late 30s. He's, uh, him and Ziggler, I think, are both 42, so... Okay, geez, sorry. Are they they're, they're, I mean, they're a bit up there, so I don't think he's... Yeah, he's no line for anything big anymore. I think he's just going to be more mid-card, like, mid-team. Not even, like, the full mid... Not even upper tier mid-card, like, mid-mid-card. Yeah, because yeah. the last time... Last time he has had, like, a real... Okay, this could be, like, a main event level situation is when he was, um... Back when Talking Smack and Daniel Bryan was still the general manager and he cut that promo, you know, it kind of felt like maybe he could have got a push there, but obviously they never did. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, the guy was WWE champion for eight whole days, though. Don't forget about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, and that's the thing is, you say that, I completely forgot. <laughs> 
eight it, spectacular, wonderful whole days. Though it was during the pandemic too, so I think a lot of people forget about the pandemic for the most part. So, um, yeah, I completely forgot about it until you just said it. So. <laughs> yeah, like oh shit, he was champion. Yep, and then uh, available relatively good stuff here. Next, Raquel Rodriguez gets interviewed. Uh, she talks about how. Um, you know, she looks forward to a match with uh, Rhea Ripley tonight. She said she's going to get the belt because Rhea Ripley doesn't have Dominic Mysterio to be there. And, uh, yeah, it was just a relatively good interview. Uh, what did you think of this, Chris, while Steve's uh, doing his thing at the moment? Um, you know, it's, it's, Raquel cuts a really good promo. Um, very confident in her abilities to win. You know, but it's, it's a good, I, I liked it. It's a good promo. Now, Steve, if you can hear me. Oh, he's back. Yep. What do you think of the Raquel Rodriguez promo? I think it's good. I think she's getting better on the mic and in the ring every week. Solid performer. I think uh, definitely ready to do something with her, but I couldn't tell you what exactly. Because they're not going to take the belt off Rhea anytime soon, so maybe a jump to SmackDown. I know, yeah, so maybe. maybe. pushes for her. Yeah, definitely. Um... Then Shayna Baszler has an interview, and she talks about taking out Zoe Stark, but she said that she did it better than a lot of people, because typically when she puts people in the Kara Fuda clutch, they end up tapping immediately, but she uh, lasted a long time, and she had to pass out from the pain. And Chelsea Green comes up to her. She has both women's tag team championships in her hands, well, over her shoulders anyways. And uh, she offers for Shayna Baszler to be a tag team partner since... Um, you know, uh, Piper Nivis isn't cleared to wrestle. They say this could be a great opportunity for her. And Shayna Baszler's not into it. She just wants to choke out Chelsea Green. So she challenges her to a match. And then Piper Niven shows back up. And we find out that, I guess she is cleared. So uh, she takes back her championship. And they just kind of walk off together. Uh, I like the I like the Shayna Baszler promo part of it. But the Chelsea Green ta woman's tag title thing. I'm just like... I'm not into it at all. Uh, I think Chris and I have talked about this. They, I think it's time to retire the women's tag team titles. I don't think it's doing anybody any good. Uh, Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, what did you think overall of uh, this segment right here? I thought the Shayna part was uh, relatively humorous. Um, she's really cutting a promo like a baby face now, which is odd because she was never like, besides that first like interaction with Ronda where she beat the crap out of her, and call her over being terrible, and the crowd cheered. That was the only time she was ever, like, a clear indication that she kind of was the baby babe. But that, yeah. the last she has been, like, back in that role again. And the Chelsea Green parts, no, Chelsea can be funny, but it's like, last week she didn't have both titles. This week she has both titles now. It was That was really weird. And then... And then Piper Niven is clear, and then she just takes it back, and it was like, what was the point of that? Yeah. Why don't you do it back to the segment where she where Piper just like takes her title back? Like I just don't get it. I didn't get it either. What did you think of this segment, Steve? I like it. I like uh, the direction they're taking Shayna Baszler in. You know, she's not going to be the clean cut baby face, but she's the face of the situation. Now she's not going to be the goody two shoes hero. She's going to be more of the uh, tweener type face. Yeah, where you know she's. Going up against heels, but she'll still beat the living shit out of people. Essentially, the Seth Rollins role that you mentioned, because I don't think Seth Rollins really has uh, gone up against like a like I like. I mean, obviously, he's turned more babyface since we've we've had that conversation, but like he's still the same character. It's just that he's going up against more heels and that are more dastardly than him and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So. Oh, he's uh, clear cut babyface, though. Yeah. It's and obvious. What, what about the Chelsea Green part? Chelsea Green's just really good at being annoying. <laughs> yeah. There's just no other way to put it. But uh, I'd say the, the problem is every time I see her, I think the same thing. I just think to myself, yep, Zack Ryder's still not with AEW, WWE, so... Yeah, I say, uh, that's Matt Gardona's wife, and he is very much wants to come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he said it a thousand times. I don't know what they're waiting for, yeah. Um... I guess like one of the big perks that we uh, want, why he wants to come back is uh, because he's been doing the Indies without Chelsea Green. Steph Delander, who uh, was in NXT at one point, um, yep. 
wants he wants her to go with him type of thing because obviously that their act's gotten over and everything like that. So that's kind of like one of the perks that you it's, know. It's fantastic. Yeah, they're uh, great. Andy's uh, Matt Cardona is like so fucking funny. He is so funny. Yeah. I do wonder how that's going to work, though. Like, would he come back, and then would they still be an item on screen? Like, would Chelsea Green, uh, you know... Um, it, it, it'd probably be something like, oh, no, she's just like my kid's nanny. We're totally uh, just friends. Something like that. Yeah, so... Uh, then we had uh, the next thing. Walter had his uh, Intercontinental Championship uh, celebration. They introduce him and everything like that. He comes out. And he's got, like, this big perch that he's standing on, uh, so a dominance, uh, that he's the Intercontinental Champion. Uh, he talks about, you know, how dominant he truly was, uh, as Intercontinental Champion. He talks about now, uh, he first thanks all of the Hall of Famers of what they've done with the Intercontinental Championship, which is absolutely nothing. He said that, that you know, he saved this championship and has made it a prestigious championship and has really made it something to fight for. He shows respect towards Chad Gable uh, for tr putting up a good fight and everything like that. And then Chad Gable comes out and he talks about how, uh, you know, he congratulates Walter on, um, you know, breaking the record and everything like that. But he says that the reason that he just can't get over the loss this time, though, is he had to see his kid cry right after he lost, and that's motivated him now to want to go after the Intercontinental Championship. And Walter obviously doesn't accept because he feels like he has nothing left to prove by beating Chad Gable again. And uh, it leads to Imperium attacking uh, Chad Gable. He does a decent job fighting him off, but obviously because it's three-on-one, uh, he, he's unable to do so, so that eventually Otis runs out to make the save. And he's beaten down because it's uh, three on one still. And then Tommaso Ciampa runs out with a steel chair and chases off Imperium. Uh, I liked all of this. I liked Chad Gable's promo here with uh, Walter. I like that gave reason for the feud to continue. It's not just like, oh, we don't have nothing else going for you. It did make sense why Chad Gable would be upset because he had to see his kid cry and all that type of stuff. And now he has like motivation to want to ch uh, dethrone Walter for the IC title. I liked how they, uh, you know... Uh, interwove, interweaved, um, Ch Tommaso Ciampa into this. I, I think, th I think he's going to be probably the next guy that actually does challenge Walter for the title. Um, maybe a triple threat, I'm not sure. But overall, I thought this segment was, uh, two thumbs up. I thought this was great stuff. And it was placed in the perfect time of the show, one hour made event, because that's exactly what it should have been. So, Steve, we're going to start with you this time. How'd you feel about the, uh, Intercontinental Championship, uh, celebration? I liked it. I liked, uh, you know, them really just presenting Walter as a dick. I don't think people appreciate the fact that he really is good at just going out there and being a complete jackass. Absolutely. Um, I was happy with um, Gable then, Otis then, Champa out of nowhere making the save. I think that could be setting up for maybe when he does make his return, Johnny Gargano. Yeah, I'd like that. Championship. And then you can do a long branched out storyline where you have Chad Gable. Versus Johnny Gargano, which would be a great match. Oh, that'd be awesome. But I don't think they've ever faced off in NXT because uh, they had NXT UK going, so, uh, you know, they never yeah, really crossed paths. It'd, it'd be a first-time ever match. They might have faced off in the Indies, and I just don't know about it type of thing, but they haven't faced off, like, in WWE. Yes, I guess I should be more clear about that. But, yeah, Chris, yeah. how did you feel about how this segment went down and everything like that? Uh, I, I loved it. Um, it was This is a great segment. Um, they really... Again, Gunther's just an amazing competitor, but, like, what's really super underrated about him is his fucking mic skills. Yeah. He's fantastic on the mic, and he speaks English better than most people who speak English. Even if it's a second language, it's, it's, you can understand him clearly, and he's, it's, he's fucking awesome. Um, but it's just the whole thing, like, I, I was kind of waiting. Like, once, once it broke down, I was like, okay, so who's going to be the third person here? After Otis to make the save for the two of them, I was relatively surprised it was Champa, um, but I loved it. I was like, okay, this makes sense. It gets him on TV. This is kind of like the thing that he was talking about with Pierce about creating opportunities, and I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I think the best part about him, I don't even think Walter even cares that he even broke the record. I think he doesn't even like care that he broke the record. <laughs> he really care, which is so funny. <laughs> At some point, they <laughs> gotta. 
some point they gotta get the honky tonk man to come back and like let Gunther beat him up. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would love it. Every minute of it. Smash him with the guitar. Um <laughs> Then uh we had uh, a backstage so that Vince can play the guitar. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because that happened, yeah, all that time ago, so. Then we had Alpha Academy and Tommaso Ciampa backstage. Um, they were just all hyped up. Ciampa said that he's out there because he's looking to make opportunities for himself. That was the conversation that, you know, he had backstage with Adam Pios. I was hoping it was going to be about something else, but obviously it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, and then uh, they challenged them to a six-man tag team match later in the night. And then later in the night, we find out that the match gets made official, so uh, there you go. Uh, I thought the segment was relatively good. I thought everybody, you know, cut really good promos here and everything like that. So it was good stuff. How did everyone feel about this segment? Yeah, they played the role. Really all there is to it. It was but good. Tommaso didn't really want to talk, so that actually, that actually is kind of funny. Yeah, it was. Uh, so. I thought it was good. I thought it, it like, established a match for later in the night. It actually did something for once. A bad thing segment pushed forward something. I like it. Um... Next match was Drew McIntyre versus Xavier Woods. Um, and it shows, a th I think they showed it earlier in the show, but I forgot to write it down. But uh, earlier in the day, Xavier Woods and Drew McIntyre had a conversation. And Xavier Wood Woods wanted to know what the deal was, like why Drew was kind of acting like a douche to Kofi uh, last week. And Drew just says that there's a lot going on in Raw right now. You know, he... Uh, is wary about Jey Uso, and he's, like, wary about why Kofi interfered and everything like that. Coincidentally, you know, after that happened, after they thought that he handled that, they handled that situation. So, um, you know, Drew says that, you know, he's basically uh, trashes the New Day. He even talked about Xavier Woods as the only one to not even win singles gold in WWE. And Xavier Woods talks about, you know, how he's right, you know, but, uh, you know... Kofi Kingston, though, he, you know, had one of the most uh, talked about moments in WrestleMania history when he won the WWE Championship. However, when you won your first WWE Championship, you won it in front of no fans. And this causes Drew to challenge Xavier Woods to a match tonight. No, Xavier challenges Drew to a match tonight. At first, Drew doesn't want to do it, obviously, because he doesn't want to hurt Xavier Woods. And uh, I think the fact... I think... Uh, but he said, you know, that he won the title in front of nobody. This kind of pushes Drew to actually challenge him. But he says that, you know, you're making a very big mistake tonight. And you're starting to see, like, the old Scottish psychopath like Drew McIntyre come out now, right before he turned babyface now, and all that type of stuff. So, I, obviously, uh, I liked that. Obviously, they had to change the segment around. I'll just talk about this now. So, there was a report of an incident that took place with Matt Riddle. Uh, at the JFK uh, airport where, like, he got into it with a cop and everything like that. Uh, however, though, that's not the reason that he wasn't there. Apparently the reason that he actually wasn't there is he had, like, a sinus infection, so he was kind of uh, fighting that, so that's why he wasn't on Raw. Um, I assume the JFK situation probably didn't help his reasons to not be on Raw. Who even knows if that was going to cause him to get suspended and all that type of stuff, but they said he should be on Raw this week. Um, so obviously they had to change the segment around type of thing. Um, but yeah, it kicked off with the, uh, the match. Uh, match was very excited, very good stuff. I thought it was absolutely awesome. Um, eventually Drew McIntyre wins finally with the Claymore kick, and he beats Xavier Woods, but they had a very back-and-forth match, so they made Xavier Woods look very strong in defeat, and we're just starting to see those heel tendencies now with, uh, Drew McIntyre. Uh, so, I, I'm starting to really like this. I actually thought he was going to lose, which would make him snap even more as a heel, but I think the fact that he won obviously makes it a little bit better. Plus, I think he needed a big win. I don't think he's had a big win in a while, obviously, because he lost last week. I know he didn't take the pin, but he still lost, and then he lost the New Day, I think, like, three weeks before that, and then obviously, I think the last time he had, like, a win was when uh, him and Riddle beat the Viking Raiders on Raw a few weeks ago, so, uh, you know, he needed a big win, so... Chris, how did you feel about how all this came together? And if you want to talk about uh, what happened with Matt Riddle, you can talk about that too because that was that was that was uh, part of it. That um, I'll start off with the Riddle thing. The Riddle thing is interesting. It's it's very odd because I honestly think the sinus infection thing is just a cover up for the it fact could. that he was at JFK Airport. Um, but he's had so many personal issues that it's just best that. Get him the fuck out of there. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, cut it. Piece his ass. Too many, too many times. There's too many. He said too many second chances. Especially, uh, especially too. Uh, I'll just talk about this too. Like they paid for him to go to rehab, and you know that hasn't worked out. And you know, I know Jeff Hardy had like a, a lot of moments where he screwed up, but at least Jeff Hardy, you know, was worth the investment type of thing. At least he opted to merge, and you know he was relatively over enough where like okay, you can kind of understand that. I don't think Matt Riddle is really worth the investment to go through all of this stuff type of thing either type of thing. So at that point, no, I just cut my losses and say you know what, we're done with you here. You're not gonna think- listen. Do anything. I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't think he's going anywhere else either. So it's just like it's it's such like a shame because it's such wasted talent. Yeah, he just comes. He comes out of rehab and just immediately starts partying with the same people that got him to there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. yeah, like it's just he's a he's a lost cause. Uh, I th- but in terms of like the match. Uh, in this in the back I thought the bad say segment was a little wonky in terms of like why are you bringing up championship wins and and whatnot it just seemed really fucking odd and thrown together last second which it probably was it just seems really odd that we'll to bring up Kofi winning the WWE championship in front of people when he didn't I thought that was very odd um, as for the match itself I I liked it. It was really good. I would have preferred Drew to lose to Snap even more because it's obvious he's going heel. Um, but I don't know if it's sooner rather than later. I think they might do the thing where they patch it up and then he does the turn. Um, but I prefer it to happen sooner as in he kicks Royal's head off like this week. Yeah, that would be so much better. Steve, your thoughts on the Matt Riddle situation and everything that happened with the Drew with so, Matt and everything like that? I'm going to go through this in four things. Number one, the match. The match was great. I thought Drew and Xavier both put on a hell of a performance. thought Xavier looked great. I thought the signs with Drew turning into a heel are clear. I would have rather, like, a roll-up win by Woods. I agree with that. You know, it doesn't have to be a dominant win. Just a quick roll-up and then... You see, like, Drew getting more and more frustrated, like, won't shake hands, like, get away from me, that kind of stuff. Then, two, like, Woods and, um, Kingston, you know, I still love the New Day, but they definitely need something more for them, and I think I speak for everyone when I say, hopefully, Big E gets better soon, because interjecting him into this storyline is going to kick it up into a whole different gear, if that's the case, obviously... That's all dependent upon if he's ready to come back. If he can come back, I hope he can. But, uh, you know, as always, get well soon, Biggie. We miss you and we want you to come back. I mean, I hope he gets uh, healthy above all else. I hope he gets healthy. But, like, again, I don't want him to, like, come back and then he's, like, we find out later, like, he he should have come back type of thing. Like, I'd rather him come back and and obviously, like, be able to, like, do this type of thing and all that type of stuff. Like, right. Um,. Yeah, so that's how it is with the new day. Um, Three, uh, Drew McIntyre, hundred fifty percent. He's going. He's turning into a heel at some point. Probably fast lane. I'd say is the uh, finish line for that heel turn. He'll probably have a match against like Kingston and Woods with Riddle. Um, and number four, Riddle. I don't know. I don't think he should be fired yet. I think probation, like a probationary period where it's like, dude, we have our eye on you, so cut the shit is fine. I think that's probably a safe bet. I would say Riddle needs to turn heel with McIntyre, and they need to become a tag team. I don't really think... I don't think there's any reason that Drew needs to be a heel on his own. I think Riddle turning into a heel would, you know, rejuvenate his character. Where he comes out and he's like, you know, you guys say you're my bros, but, you know, I want to get to the top. You're not getting me there, but Drew McIntyre is. And they can have those two teaming up on Seth Rollins for the rest of the year going into the Rumble next year. And they don't have to be a long-term tag team. Like, they can be an alliance for a bit and then, you know, Survivor Series, Seth beats McIntyre. 
like end of the year, he beats Riddle, and then going into the Rumble, those two start to split up and they have a triple threat. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that too much because I think Matt Riddle, his gimmick's very stale too, and I don't think it's really connected anymore because of his real life stuff, like, you know, type of yeah. thing. So, um, and if that triple threat were to happen at the Rumble and even Seth wins, that might leave him susceptible to someone in the Judgment Day. Hint, hint. Yeah, so. Yeah, overall, relatively uh, great stuff. Let's continue talking about Raw. Uh, Cody Rhodes comes out to cut a promo. He's still so over. I talked about Chris the other day. Do you remember uh, last year, like, uh, not even last year, early 2021, Cody was so directionless in AEW, but he wasn't over? It's kind of the same thing going on. He doesn't really have a lot going on, but he's so over right now that it really doesn't matter right now type of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of the opposite of that having to happen. Um, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, looking down on his son, Cody Rhodes. He's doing good. He's doing but I great. gotta say, my other son, Dustin, he gotta get rid of that red tape thing. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, and yeah, Co before Cody can really say anything, uh, J.D. McDonough and Dominic Mysterio come out. And Dominic Mysterio talks about how Cody should feel bad because he put, went through all of this effort just to get Jey Uso on Raw, basically taking a risk, and the risk isn't going to be worth the reward because he's, he's most likely going to be joining the Judgment Day. It's tough to obviously make out exactly what Dominic Mysterio says because you couldn't hear him type of thing. He was just getting booed and all that type of stuff, which I love. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, eventually uh, Dominic attacks Cody. Eventually, it's a two-on-one beatdown with, uh, D you know, Dominic and JD attacking Cody. Eventually, Cody's able to fight him off. He lays out JD with the... Uh, um, Crossroads, and then he does the same thing to Dominic Mysterio, and then the segment just ends. We never find out what Cody was going to say because, you know, he got cut off and everything like that. So, overall, relatively uh, good segment here. It's setting up to a match on Raw this upcoming week between Cody and Dominic Mysterio. That could end up being Cody's last match on Raw because, obviously, the big thing is uh, it's revealed uh, that someone's getting getting traded, it's obviously, I think, going to end up being Cody, that's the guy that's going to get traded, which it doesn't really yeah. matter anyways, because everyone just shows up wherever they want to anyways, but whatever. Um, a, wild, a wild card rule, kid. <laughs> but anyhow, overall, I thought this was good stuff. Everyone got to see Cody, and, you know, he, he got to do something, so relatively good stuff. Uh, Steve, how'd you feel about this segment? I felt like it was pretty decent, I think Cody's definitely, definitely getting traded to SmackDown. Yeah. Um... But, you know, we could see a scenario where, hell, maybe even Vince calls in J.D. McDonough and says, Kid, from now on, we're going to start calling you Jed. <laughs> Jed. Jed McDonough. That'd be awesome. Jed, no. <laughs> we're going to call you Jed McDonough, kid. No, in all seriousness, though, um, I do think Cody's going to be getting ready to smack down and his Sayonara match is going to be against Judgment Day. And that's, like I said earlier, possibly going to lead into a feud between the bloodline having to be forced back into working with each other to face them. That'd be cool. I didn't I didn't say it earlier, but yes, I would uh, 100% get Rhea Ripley involved in that. Oh, yeah. Instead, instead of J.D. McDonough, I would have that be the big twist. Is like He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the fourth guy. And they're like, no, no, we're actually going to take Rhea Ripley into war games with us. Now, does, she, do you, does Desmond Day get a woman in there, or like, is, she, is it going to be an intergender type of match? I would say intergender, but if you had to, I would say Nia Jax is probably the closest person. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's one closer person, but she's with a different company, so obviously that's just not going to work. So, well, um, Tamina, too, actually. Yeah, but we haven't seen her on TV. Who is Mina? I was going to say, who Mina? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody, apparently. Chris, how did you feel about the Cody segment right here? Um, I felt wonderful. It was great. Um, I love watching uh, Rey Mysterio's uh, piss and piece of shit son get his ass kicked. Um, it was the best feeling in the in the world uh, watching him get his fucking ass kicked because he's a piece of shit. Um, yeah. Seeing seeing me at crossroads and fucking super kicked on the same night made me very happy. Very, very love, happy. I would love to see Dom come face to face with Rhea's uh how we say buddy. <laughs> That'd be awesome. 
Uh, because Buddy's been getting the worst of it on, you know, AEW, because everyone just brings up the fact, you know, that his wife's just sleeping with somebody else on TV and all that type of stuff, so. The fact that he's a cuck? <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Um, so then, uh, Jey Uso's backstage, and, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Finn Balor comes up to him, I think this is the segment, and, uh, he's trying to basically convince him to join Judgment Day, he said, you know, I know we just fought each other, but that's the nature of being in the wrestling business. And he talks about how nobody trusts you right now, but if you join the Judgment Day, and he tries to use Dominic Mysterio as an example, because this was roughly this was roughly like the one year point where Dominic Mysterio joined Judgment Day. So uh, he tells Jay to think about it, um, and then he kind of just kind of walks off. So uh, yeah, relatively good stuff here. It continues the stuff with Jay Uso. Um, I kind of hope they do something where like they kind of pull what they did with like. You know, various baby faces where they pretend, where he acts like he pretends to join the faction, puts on the t-shirt and everything like that, and then eventually it's a swerve and he just ends up doesn't end up doing it. I think that'd be a good segment, but uh, puts on the t-shirt and then he rips it off, and it's actually the um, NWO Wolfpack shirt. <laughs> that'd be hilarious. Um, or it's a not even it's a Judgment Day Wolfpack t-shirt type of thing. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, Steve, how did you feel about this backstage segment right here? Yes. Same idea overall, pretty good. I mean, it'll be interesting to see where it all goes in the end, I think. How'd you feel about this, Chris? It was fine. It was okay. Um, then we had the next match. It was uh, Chelsea Green with Piper Niven inside versus Shayna Baszler. Essentially a squash match here. Chelsea Green doesn't get a lot of offense in. And uh, Shayna Baszler wins with like a gut wrench face buster type move. Uh, there's a name for it now, uh, but I forget what it is. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, she takes it to Piper Niven, but because it's two on one, uh, she ends up uh, getting taken down. And Zoe Stocks runs out to make the save, and they kind of work together to take out the tag champs. And it looks like we're going to get some type of tag team right here between Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark, which I'm pretty much a fan of. I think that's going to be awesome. Um, I hope they win the belts. I don't know, I kind of want them to win the belts, but I feel like if they win the belts, there's going to be something bad that's going to happen. Because anyone who wins the women's tag belts, is like a curse on the tag belts type of thing. So I don't know if I want to see, uh, you know, them win the tag belts. But, you know, because then that's just, either you get booked badly, you're going to get an injury, it's just, it's going to happen type of thing. But, uh, yeah, Steve, how'd you feel about how all this went down? I'm definitely in the same boat of being cautious about those women tag belts because, yes. Get rid of them. <laughs> like, I, I even, like, I tried arguing for the, oh, well, you know, just spread them up between all three brands, and that'll make enough tag teams. And they did that, and I was wrong. They're still just so pointless. I know. I mean, they, I mean, I love the tag division WWE has going right now, but, like, even they, like, they've limited it to the freaking one tag titles, because... They don't have enough to keep both divisions going. Especially, which is crazy. especially like limited. They don't have, yeah, the men don't even have enough for two tag divisions. The women don't. It's just, yeah, they just point the spells. So I would get rid of them. Especially too, uh, it's you notice the limitations of it when uh, Kevin Owens went out with his injury and they couldn't defend the belts for like a month almost too. So the yeah. tag teams were kind of left uh, scrambling. But anyhow, how did you feel about this uh, match? And, Everything like that, Chris. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Um, it's it, it served its purpose, but yeah, the tight belts are trash. Um, next. Oh, by the way, I might say right now I'm watching College Game Day, and The Rock is the guest picker. Oh, nice. okay, that's good. We'll get we'll get to him later on. Um, <laughs> but um, Shinsuke Nakamura cut to promo. Uh, he's in the gym training. And he talks about uh, how Seth Rollins is slowly starting to get weakened. He's starting to wear him down. And he notices that Seth's ego is just too uh, much in the way for him to realize that. And he said that, you know, he's not going to let Seth dictate when he has his world title match. Because uh, he's, he's the one that he feels like he's in control right now. He has all the cards are in his table. And he said that, you know, he will have his world title rematch when he feels like it's the right time. I liked this. I obviously like the presentation of Shinsuke Nakamura right now, obviously. I think this is the best he's ever been presented, main roster-wise, anyways, so I thought this was awesome. Uh, Chris, how did you feel about Shinsuke Nakamura's little promo he cuts right here? Uh, 
Um, I thought it was really good, and it's just, it's honestly his best utilization on the main roster right now. Um, yeah, he looks really fucking strong, and I'm kind of happy this feud's going on. How'd you feel about this, Steve? I felt good about it. I definitely agree that this is the strongest Shinsuke has looked since WrestleMania 34. Yeah. Back when he was feuding with AJ, and then they decided to, pun absolutely intended, have him go nuts. <laughs> now he's going back, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, I see what you did there, good one. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, um, but, yeah, he's looked really, really good in this feud, uh, working as a heel. Um, starting to wonder if they're going to have him go back to his other theme song, which I'd be okay with. I'm wondering too if he's too, I'm wondering if he's winning the belt just because of how great his presentation has been and all that type of stuff. But yeah, but it is funny where he's like, "Oh yeah, I'll I'll get that title match, but I'm not going to tell you when." But I mean, it doesn't take a genius to be like, "Hey, when's Fastlane?" <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, so uh, then Seth Rollins comes out to cut a promo. Uh, he. Uh, you know, talks about how he realizes what Shinsuke Nakamura was doing. He's done this before. He talks about how he's done all of these personas. Because Nakamura mentioned that when he was doing this uh, in his promo. Like, Nakamura, like Seth pretty much got to the top by stabbing people in the back and all that type of stuff. And Seth's the one that's taking offense with Nakamura trying to stab him in the back. He's like, how do you like now that you'll be the one that's being stabbed in the back? And he, th- he talks about how poetic that it was that, you know... Seth made a career out of doing that, and now his back's just hated on by a thread. But anyhow, Seth also ta- calls out Shinsuke Nakamura. He wants to have the World Heavyweight Championship match now. Nakamura's music, Nakamura's music goes off. Uh, I almost called him Naka Music. I don't know what the hell was going on there. <laughs> Naka Music. I guess he's Naka Music now. So, um, <laughs> but um, backstage we see Nakamura laying out Ricochet, just absolutely destroying him. And Nakamura's just like, gee, Seth, I'm sorry. I was going to actually come out there and have the fight, but then I ended up getting into a fight already backstage, so I don't really feel the need to have a match right now. So we're going to have to take a rain check, pretty much. Overall, I thought this was uh, relatively good stuff. It, it set up a match for next week between Nakamura and Ricochet, which, you know, is going to be good stuff. I would have added a stipulation to that match, but I guess there's a, maybe they will add one, and, and they'll just do it on Raw, but I think they should have added a stipulation to that match, but whatever. Uh, how did you feel about how this segment went down, Steve? I thought it was good. Um, I don't know why he attacked Ricochet out of nowhere, but... So, so you might have missed that episode of uh, well, they had an altercation last week, so that's why, oh right, uh, yeah, that's right, they did. Uh, but yeah, it's obviously just setting up for those two to have a fight, and then maybe Ricochet gets his title shot at some point. I don't know. Uh, Chris, how do you feel about this segment? I liked it. It showed uh, Nakamura's viciousness um, that he can be dangerous at any time. And yeah, I like the fact that it's going to be um, Ricochet versus Nakamura next week. That match is going to tear the, going to tear the house down. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Then Jey Uso's backstage again. Um, Drew McIntyre comes up with him, and he basically says that he's in the same boat with Kevin Owens, how he doesn't trust him and everything like that. And he said that he's going to go to Adam Pearce, and he's going to uh, make a match between them. And he said that he should be worried because he just beat the crap out of someone that he didn't even want to beat the crap out of. But now he's going to be beating somebody up that he's looking forward to. And, uh, yeah, uh, that was pretty much a decent segment right there. I thought it was a good way to set up a match. How did you feel about this, Chris? I liked it. I thought it was, uh, moved along the story. I liked it. Had a it, purpose. I feel it was on two stories, actually. Drew going heel and no one trusting Jay. So, you know, it, it works out both ways. Uh, how do you feel about this, Steve? I agree uh, with uh, no one trusting the no one trusting Jay storyline. Eventually, it's gonna blow up, and he's gonna have to. The people are gonna have to start trusting him. I think. And yet, if that storyline I suggested happens, that'll be like the turning point. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, how that would work out. If they do your storyline, I wonder if he was the one that cost the bloodline the war games match in the end of the day. He just super kicks them. Uh, I was going to say and leaves the match, but he can't leave the match because that's the big thing is if you leave the match, you forfeit the match type of thing. So, right. Uh, but, you know, he essentially super kicks them and allows Judgment Day to get the win. But then I'm wondering how does that work when it comes to, like, then he has to, they have to wrap up the Judgment Day storyline if they do that type of thing. So we'll have to figure that out. Um, but 
Then we had Alpha Academy and Tommaso Ciampa versus Imperium. Very good match right here. Very good six-man tag. Uh, eventually, um, Chad Gable uh, locks in a uh, anchor lock, and then he grapevines it onto uh, Fabian Eichner. And Walter tries to prevent this from happening, but Ciampa locks him into a uh, resilience lock. I think it's called. I think is what it was called. And uh, Walter can't stop this. And uh, Eichner may, uh, taps out to the ankle lock, and Chad Gable gets a big victory. I thought this all made sense. I liked how uh, you know they made uh, Ciampa and Gable look strong. Um, because obviously they're the two top contenders probably at the moment for the IC title. You know, Gable needed a big win from last week, and Ciampa needed to look strong. So I imagine what's probably going to happen is I think maybe not next week, but probably like the week after or something, they're going to do a number one contenders match. And I actually think uh, Ciampa will win the number one contenders match because I think they're going to try to delay the Gable-Walter rematch as long as possible. Either they're yeah. probably, probably going to do that Survivor Series or maybe even Wumble time because... Uh, I imagine Walter's probably going to be the guy that dethroned Seth Rollins for the title, so maybe they're going to try to get the IC belt off of him before then. Um, right. But, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, how did you feel about this match, Steve, and how it, all, how it played out? I felt it was good. I uh, definitely agree with the idea that um, Champa is going to be the one to get a shot at him next, and they'll put off the big Gable rematch. I could see that happening. I could also see it going the other way where Gable just gets his rematch and loses again. And then they step into a Champa and eventually maybe DIY against um, Imperium Feud. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't think uh, Gunther's going to be the one to dethrone Rollins, though. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, Chris, how did you feel about how this six man tag team match played out? I thought it was good. Right team won. Uh, um, yeah, I liked it. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes from here. Then next, uh, Tiffany Stratton's backstage. She's not happy to be there because, like, she doesn't have a mask or anything like that. She's happy. She's pissed. She has to come there to do the contract signing where they could have just, you know, faxed over slash emailed the contract over to her. And Becky Lynch comes up and she talks about how Tiffany Stratton made a big mistake when she uh, called her out a few weeks ago. And Tiffany Stratton doesn't understand why Becky Lynch is so upset with her because she apologized for that miscorrection type of thing. And, uh, you know, Becky Lynch took offense to it and all that type of stuff. And Becky Lynch says that it doesn't matter because I'm going to take the NXT Women's title and I'm going to put my name in with greatness and talked about how she, you know, wants to have that one in NXT. She truly felt like that she never got to have. And they both signed the contract and then it ends. Uh, this is probably the best Tiffany Stratton segment I've ever seen in my life. That's mainly because of Becky Lynch, I hate to say it. Um, but, yeah, all, all, I thought this did a good job of setting up the title match. I thought it made sense to do this segment on Raw to get the viewership up for NXT, which ends up working out in, um, in favor of them. So, overall, I thought this was all relatively uh, good stuff. It made all the sense in the world. Uh, Chris, how did you feel about this backstage segment? This backstage, this backstage segment was fantastic, only because of Becky Lynch. Uh, Tiffany Stratton can't talk. Uh, she's terrible, and she's terrible in the ring. So, um, Becky Lynch by a mile. There you go. How'd you feel about this, Steve? Chris pretty much said it. Tiffany Stratton sucks. She yeah. just... I, said, I think I said it to you before. I don't think I said it to Chris. Chris, who does Tiffany Stratton look like? Maybe someone who had a big movie come out this summer. I have no idea. Barbie. Tiffany Stratton is 1,000% a Barbie cashman. That is the only reason they pushed her. That is the only reason they gave her the belt. But now that that movie is leaving theaters, they have no further use for her. All I have to stay, say about Tiffany Stratton is have fun in AEW. There you go. Because you've been future endeavored. Yeah. I think I think Chris wants her to go to AEW and go to like Rampage, so that way she'll never have to see you ever again, type of thing too. So um, Maybe she's just terrible. Yeah. <laughs> she's not good. Um next we had the main event. Uh we already covered that we already covered the show, so Chris can stay right here. So um it was You're for lucky. the 
It was for the Women's World Championship. It was uh, Rhea Ripley defending against uh, Raquel Rodriguez. Very good main event here. Very back and forth. I thought this was better than the payback match. Just because I thought, uh, you know, they were able to put a little bit more into it and all that type of stuff. And considering the fact, you know, that um, it was a less predictable about who was going to win. I mean, it was... No doubt that Rhea was going to win, but then, you know, there wasn't that whole thing with Judgment Day just winning all the titles type of thing, so it was obvious Rhea was going to win a payback, so at least it was a little bit of, like, uh, believability that Rhea Raquel could have won this time, especially since Storm was banned from inside, but during the match, uh, Raquel clearly could have had the match won, but behind the ref's back, uh, Nia Jax returns, she throws uh, Raquel through the announcer's table, um, and she doesn't go through the table itself, she goes through, like, the bottom part of the table, which I thought was really cool, um, and then eventually, uh, Rhea Ripley hits the Riptide on her for the win, and then Raquel lays out, uh, sorry, not Raquel, but, uh, Nia Jax lays out, uh, Rhea Ripley completely destroys her, uh, hits a bonsai bomb from the, uh, middle turnbuckle, um, and holds up the title, so, I didn't like this finish, I was not happy to see Nia Jax back, I, uh, I think you could just take what I said from the Rumble review after the Shark Corner and just place it here. Uh, probably same thing for Chris, but uh, yeah, I'm not happy to see Nia Jax back. Uh, they're probably going to set up maybe a triple threat or a one-on-one -on -one match at um, Fastlane, and then maybe the one-on-one -on -one match at um, Survivor Series slash... Uh, I know there's a Saudi show before that. I don't even know what it's going to be called yet, but whatever the Saudi show is. Um, that will probably be where, you know... I kind of hope Nia Jax is just there, just so that way she could just put Rhea Ripley over, and she kind of, she could still, like, have a presence, I guess, on the show, but that's, like, the biggest thing that she does type of thing, because, yeah, I'm not happy to see Nia Jax back. I'm not looking forward to the promos, because the promos are just terrible that she cuts, but, you know, it is what it is. But overall, uh, Steve, how did you feel about the, how the main event played out, and, you know, Nia Jax being back and everything like that? I was happy to see Nia Jax back, uh, you know, I'm hoping maybe she's had some time to freshen up her skills we'll see yeah uh, i would like i would like to see nia Jax join the bloodline i think that would really make things interesting whatever's left but, of the bloodline anyways yeah well it'll, it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here um yeah yeah because other than that i don't really see rhea ripley dropping the belt to either of them still but it's definitely an interesting person to bring back yeah, I guess so. Uh, Chris, how did you feel about the main event one, and Nia Jax being back and everything like that? I thought the match was good. And, you know, the, they weren't taking the, the belt off of Rhea. That was pretty obvious. Um, Nia Jax returning, I was like, who fucking cares? I was like, she's like, it's, that's the, my initial thought was like, wow, I don't fucking care. <laughs> I'm like, I literally don't fucking care. I was like, wow. Like, why is she back? Like, I was like, okay, all right. No one even made a big deal about it. Everyone's like, okay, I guess so. Normally when someone returns or if someone debuts, they make it, the dirt sheets to make a huge deal about it, but there was nothing. Yeah. I was, like, I was like, okay, they don't care, clearly. So why should I care? I mean, I, didn't, I haven't cared about Nia Jax in 10 years, so why the fuck should I care about her now? <laughs> that's hilarious, too, because that's how long she's been in the wrestling, so... <laughs> I literally have not fucking cared about her since she debuted. Her storyline's been so meh. She's hurting a bunch of people. And she's just so useless out there. And the funniest part was when she did the bonds I dropped, and then she started fucking rubbing her ass cheeks on, on Rhea and then slapping her across the face. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I was hoping she wiped, because that's she left some, some fucking doo-doo stains on there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anyhow, that was Wa. Obviously, the biggest thing of Wa. Well, two big thi Well, three big just, things on Wa. I just hope she finally got her hole fixed after that incident. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> as soon as I saw her run down, I was like, My oh, back. Okay. My and, like, <laughs> But I can <literally> fucking <laughs> care less about her. <laughs> um, that was the best stuff. <laughs> Oh, but anyhow, my hole. <laughs> that's all people cared about her. And the yeah. last like year of her run, that's like, the only fucking reason people cared about her is because she said because she said my hole. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and then she got mad. So like, 
because we were making fun of her for it. But anyhow, uh, you know, obviously that was Raw. This was a relatively significant show in a sense. Uh, first Raw that Vince uh, started making changes to. Um, we knew it happened sooner than later. Uh, you know, obviously there's been pictures of that with Vince that's come out online, which we're going to talk about. Uh, I completely forgot. I'm like, dude just had spinal surgery. And he's already up walking around and all that type of stuff. Like, this dude is not human. Like, um, but... Um, yeah, we figured that happened at some point again, that Vince would start rewriting the shows. I assume he did this, too, because, uh, this was the last Raw and last WWE show, uh, run by the McMahon family, pretty much. Obviously, the merger was made official, uh, the next day. So, that's why, uh, I think Vince probably had his fingerprints a little bit on this show, was because, obviously, the merger was gonna happen, so... It is what it is. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts about that? You know, end of an era right here. The the last uh, wrestling show. Well, the last WWE wrestling show run by the McMahon family type of thing. Pretty significant. I, I don't think it's necessarily the last show run by the McMahons. I mean, they're still going to be delegated as the ones in charge of it. Yeah, I guess one last show run by them where they're the owners of the whole company. Yeah, exactly. The whole, like... They're not the owners of WWE anymore, so like we're right. just being like the full time owners. Um, I, I just hope that the TKO Sports merger sees that Vince is a complete fool who should be nowhere near a creative room. Yeah, especially with uh, I don't think it's gonna happen to be honest with you. Him and Ari are pretty close. Yeah. But yeah, we we would all like that too, especially uh with how Wrestle with the wall after WrestleMania went, uh, and how badly that you know that was a just a disaster. But we'll see. Overall, though, I still liked this well a lot. I probably would have given this show honestly like an A minus had uh, Nia Jax not returned. But it's went down to a B plus because I actually was enjoying everything on Raw for the most part up until Nia Jax came back. So uh, Nia Jax had kept the show for being an A, so it's going to a B plus. Uh, Steve, I don't know if we do letter grades, but what did you, uh, what, what, what's your, like, rate in the voir, whatever you do? We're gonna go right in the middle of the C. Okay. So there you go. Uh, Chris, what would you grade, voir? Um, I'm in the B-plus range, too. I thought this show was, was relatively, was actually very good. Um, but yeah, Nia Jax was training at the end. Could fucking care less about that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, the last Raw run solely by the McMahon family was a, fair, was a relatively good one. Yeah, I feel like they, I feel like too, uh, they really felt, that's, that's why Vince, I think, did make changes, but he tried to make sure they weren't, like, bad changes type of thing, because I think he wanted, like, it, they, the McMahon family themselves wanted the last show to be, like, a knockout. Huh? I think it was, like, they had sure. Cody going first, and they switched it to Jay. They moved the Viking Raiders and Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin to main event. But it was nothing that was, like, egregious. Yeah. These reports, by the way, anytime Vince makes a change, they make it seem like it's, like, egregious type of thing. Like, they, anytime he makes like, any type of change in the show, they make it seem like it's egregious type of thing. It wasn't even notable. It wasn't even, like, Yeah. oh, my God, this is definitely Vince. It didn't even feel like that. Yeah, so. The ending did, 100%. But, like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, that's Raw. Uh, Steve, do you want to take us through, uh, NXT? Yes, I will, and sadly, I have to leave after I do NXT, so I will try to do my best to get us through NXT. All right, do you want to give you some quick thoughts, then, on SmackDown, since you won't be here for it, because that's a pretty significant show? Uh, yes. The Rock. Me? Is that, is that all you have the to Rock. say? Is that all you have to say? <laughs> no, the, the Rock coming back was friggin' amazing, um... Always happy to see him, but at the same time, I was a little disappointed that it couldn't have been on a show where Roman was there. Yeah. Or that they couldn't have even had a single interaction with Heyman or Solo or Jimmy. It's like, I'm going to give WWE the benefit of the doubt and say they're waiting and not say they're lazy, because if they're lazy, that's just unforgivable. Yeah. Because it's that's pretty much that pretty much be the equivalent of like, hey, here's free money, and then going me, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> Anything else you want to say about SmackDown before you take us through NXT? Um, let me just pull up my SmackDown notes really, really quick. Let's see.
Here we go. Um, I should also note that Jimmy and Jay's theme songs are now available on YouTube, and they are spectacular. They got those out quick, too. They never get them out that quick. Yeah, they've been quicker about getting music out. Uh, Pat McAfee also returned at the start of the show, but it was probably for a one night only, and that's disappointing because he is by far the best commentator in wrestling today, and he's not he, he's not even full time. Yeah, uh, he elevates everyone who's around him. I would be very okay if uh, they decide to go in a direction where McAfee takes over full time and Corey Graves just. Have fun in AEW. There you go. I still don't enjoy him as a commentator at all. Uh, we had AJ Styles versus Finn Balor match. I thought was very good. Uh, Jimmy getting involved, keeping that feud going because I think Jimmy is definitely, well, sorry, AJ is definitely Roman's next opponent, so that's why he's involved. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe Karrion Cross gets involved again. Maybe. We'll see uh, Rey Mysterio and Santos Escobar setting up a United States title match down the line, but also now they're beefing with the Street po- the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley. It'll be interesting to see where that storyline goes. Uh, I don't know. I don't like Bobby Lashley's character right now because he's not working as a tweener. It's like, heel or face, pick one. Yeah, I felt like I, and I definitely think it should be heels since that faction is meant to be heels type of thing. So yeah, LA Knight versus uh, the Miz, very good rematch. Very happy night one, and he made it clear that he is going after gold after the match. But kind of in a you know, like you know, like when he said it, it was kind of like I caught it up yours too, WWE. They, they just having him say that because there's no plans for him. They just want to have him keep putting that's fine, but like. Set something up for the guy at this point. That's fair. And then they had, what else? They had uh, Oscar versus Bailey, where um, Oscar won after Sinead O'Connor. I, I mean, um, Shotzi distracted Damage Control. And no, I will not apologize for that comment because that is completely what Shotzi's character is now. There you go. She's a deranged anorexic Sinead O'Connor. Tell me I'm wrong. Anybody? I, I don't know who that is, so I, I can't even tell you you're wrong. Hey, you're right. That, that, that is her freaking character. And I, Shanti wasn't good to begin with, and now she's just even more whatever, I guess. Um, yeah. I do, I, uh, hope, yeah. I do think Damage Control is going to break up soon, but then we had the uh, main event segment, which was the Grayson Waller effect with John Cena. And uh, Cena came out before he could even really get going. Waller was calling him out, saying, "You're you're washed up. You know, you're not nearly the greatest of all time anymore." So Cena was ready to fight, which brought out Jimmy Uso, which brought out Solo Sokoa. Uh, Solo looked like he was going to attack Jimmy, but it was a fake out, so he could attack Cena. And then they started teaming up, beating Cena down, which brought out AJ Styles. And the second AJ came out my letter grade for SmackDown dropped because it should have been The Rock. That would have been nice. But then they ha- especially because they had an interaction, like, you know, early on the show type of thing, so... Yeah. Absolutely should have been The Rock, and that that's where it's like... Are you just being lazy, WWE, or are you really making us wait like it sucks? <laughs> that's fair. What would you give a uh, letter grade to, like, SmackDown overall? B. Okay. Uh, and yeah, just... Um, Chris and I, uh, that's why we're not really saying anything. We're going to cover SmackDown when you leave, so that's why we haven't really been giving you any fee- feedback or giving you, giving you much to work with. But let's just go, let's cover NXT. Yeah. All right. So NXT was, uh, let's see. So it was uh, the September 12th episode of NXT. We had Booker T, Vic Joseph on commentary. Booker T is still one of the worst commentators I've ever heard in my life. Chris and I mention it every week. What are you talking about? You don't like Mr. Grunts? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, t- tell me I'm wrong. You know, Vic Joseph would be like, oh, wow, that was a great DDT. Oh, let me tell you about the DDT. Or like the DDP. Because DDP and I used to go out in the bar every night. 
I swear to God. Every week he just goes off on the most random of tangents. So this is how he went up there. Or he just doesn't speak for ten minutes. The Fed that and Victor Joseph has to ask him three separate times what he thought about that. What that was. Like, Victor Joseph, like, that, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen, Booker. What do you think? Oh look, I got a ducky. I got a ducky. I got a ducky. One of the big things he's been doing lately too. He's like calling somebody out in the crowd that I think only like he knows type of thing, and uh, yeah. he doesn't explain who that person even is type of thing. Like probably someone from Chase U. <laughs> Could be. <Which> <laughs> um, yeah, so we had the arrival of Becky Lynch into the arena for her main event match, but we opened up with Wesley versus Ilya Dragunov for the NXT Championship, or sorry, an NXT Championship number was contender match. Um, that's is very good. I'm actually pulling up my notes now. That's fair. Here we go. Yeah, so we, um, yes, we had Wesley versus Ilya Dragunov, number one contenders match for the NXT Championship. Thought it was a really good match. Uh, Leon Dragunov going back and forth. Just a very athletic match overall. I think it was obvious from the get-go Dragunov was going to pick up the win because they're really trying to tell the story of Wesley just being down on his luck every single week, and that's exactly what happened. Dragunov won by pinfall. Yep. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they go from here, but what do you guys think of the match? Uh, yeah, overall, I thought the match was uh, very good, very exciting. Uh, right person, I thought, won this match, obviously. Um I like what they're doing with Wesley type of thing. It's ba- it's pretty much uh, the Sami Zayn, Johnny Gargano storyline they've done in NXT type of thing, which I think, you know, has worked out very well for them. I hope it leads to kind of him being the one that dethrones Carmelo Hayes for the belt eventually type of thing. So, yeah, overall yeah. good stuff. And, you know, they have to, they kind of have to wrap up the Ilya Dragunov storyline. So, overall, I thought this was good stuff. Yep. Very good stuff. Chris, I thought it was good. Um, again, like, Wesley just continues to deliver on these opening matches every single fucking week. It's the same fucking shit. He goes up there and just dominates these fucking matches and kills at these matches uh, every week. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where they go with him because he's he's turning heel. It's obvious. Yeah. Do I think it will work? Mm, probably not because his, his style, his entrance... His charisma does not profile as heel at all. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but the match was great, and Ray Price won. Yeah, and uh, after the match, Lee did uh, pretty much tell everyone to get out of the locker room, and then he left and seemed like he might not come back, but I think he's definitely going to come back to the heel during that match, whenever it is. Yeah, it's at No Mercy. No, uh, no Mercy, yeah. Yeah, overall, I thought they did that very well, so. All right, following this, we had uh, Baron Corbin uh, doing a segment where he was trying to respect Braun, you know, he was, like, trying to respect Braun Breaker for attacking Von Wagner, but also not. It was kind of a weird segment because they're both blatantly heel, and they had... Corbin trying to show sympathy without showing sympathy. It felt like it was so weird. Watching the segment, I was like, and so it came to the point where it's like, Corbin, you've been a heel for how many years now? Like, just go face, just turn into a face and give it a shot at this point. <laughs> Not gonna hurt you because being a heel ain't gonna help you anymore. Uh, yeah, so, um, Overall, I thought I, I thought the segment was good enough. Like it did what it needed to do, but it's not what it could have been. Like they honestly should have pulled the trigger on the Baron Corbin babyface turn. They had the perfect opportunity to do so here, and I think they completely missed the boat with it. Like there's kind of no point to even really do a match. Like it was just so really it was, the segment was so weird too because it seems like they're gonna be friendly, and then all of a sudden Vaughn we- not Vaughn Wagner Vaughn Breaker. Um, just calls him a dummy out of nowhere type of thing, and talking about how he doesn't care about his respect yeah. and all that type of stuff. For, for to mention the uh, extent of the injury, Von Wagner has a fractured skull and no timeline for a turn. Uh, that's death. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I didn't, cover, 
I didn't cover the news then last week. I hear the reason they had to go black did, was there was a bad botch that happened doing this type of yeah, thing. Yeah, I saw a different angle of it. He like he didn't really smash his head into it, but a uh, piece of step like kind of when he went down, turned and like whacked him. Okay, so <laughs> like, he got cut, it, was, it, was it was one of the steps when he did it. Came down yeah. on that back of the head. Yeah, they said he's fine though. That was literally just a cut. So is that why they had to do the black screen, or were they going to do that anyways? They were going to do that anyway. Okay. I'm yeah, just trying to make it seem like it was extremely severe. But yeah, so I guess I guess Von Rag is going to come back as a zombie, I guess. Halloween Havoc's coming up, so that makes sense. So coming come back it as a zombie back. from ECW. <laughs> <laughs> no, better yet, he can come back as the Yeti, because, you know, that's... that's, that's he can come back as the Yeti. Just, just make sure that they just have to make sure that the security is really ramped up, so no one with a Singapore cane in a beer can come in from the crowd to beat him up. <laughs> well, if yeah. he comes back to Yeti, you gotta watch out. He might try to hump someone. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Chris, what did you think of the Baron Corbin Vaud Wagner segment overall and everything like that? Um, I, I mean, I liked it, um, but I knew it was going in this direction. The fake sympathy I could have done without. Um, he came out very sincere, but I was like, he's turning heel at some point in this promo. At first, I was like, oh, that's interesting. They're going to have Baron Corbin come out and talk about Von Wagner, but he wasn't his usual braggadocious self. And I was like, okay, he's going to go back to being like the dickish heel again. I was like, this is so fucking obvious. Um, I could have done without the fake sympathy, though. How many times have they done that in WWE where it's like, Someone gets hurt, and the heel comes out and cuts up, cuts the stupid fake sympathy promo. It, it works. It, it, they do it. They do it all the time, and it's it's kind of cut and dry at this point. Yeah. And I could have done without it. I'd rather just have him just go face. I've been saying this for years now that he should go face. He should have went face three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. It's 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 fucking time for him to, to make the character switch. And I think if this is it. His feud with with uh, Von uh, with with uh, Braun Breaker has him go face. I'll be fine with it, but I could have done without the fucking fake sympathy. We forgot to mention too the they are having a match and the match is set up. It, it, it's official for No Mercy now, so there you go. They had a better pull up our brawl than him and Gable Stevenson had. Yes, they did. Indeed. Yeah, so after this, we had a three-on-three match. Drew Gulak, Charlie Dempsey, and Damon Kemp versus Josh Briggs, Brooke Jensen, and Miles Bourne. Real quick match. Uh, Kemp, Gulak, and Dempsey picked up the victory to no surprise because I think Briggs and Jensen are just the resident genre team of NXT at this point. Uh, Fallon Henley, I mean... It's like that office meme, you know, if you held up a picture of Keanu James and you held a picture of Fallon Henley, it's the same picture because they're both just garbage. <laughs> I don't think either of them are good wrestlers. Uh, Briggs and Jensen are just boring. I really am not behind either of them. I, I'd like to think I am, but I'm not. Uh, yeah, there's really not much to go on with this match. What do you guys think? Uh, you can start, you can start, Chris. I thought that, that it was... Uh... It was very odd because they've been having Miles Bourne like be the whipping boy for uh, Charlie Dempsey, Drew Bu- and Drew Gulak, yeah, and Damon Kemp, and then they just then he just like randomly sides with Briggs and Jensen, and then just fucking turns on him anyway. It's like, what's the point? Like, what was the fucking point? Um, but yeah, like they it, it, Briggs and Jensen deserve better than this. I mean, they they've been ruined since that. Horrific feud that they had with each other, with Fallon Henley and, and Keanu James. So I think we've we've gone into depth over that, yeah, too many times. And it's it was it's one of the worst feuds NXT's had in in, in, in forever. I think um, if, I think if we do year end awards, that might be the worst feud uh, in WWE this year type of thing because like, it ruined a promising tag team. Yeah, completely ruined them. Yeah. They were interesting. They were. They were fun to watch, and then they were the NXT UK Tag Champs, and they were fucking really good. And after that, it's like gotten on the shitter because they haven't—they're barely even on TV. 
And it's like, it's like, what the fuck happened? Like, they don't have a fucking tag team division to begin with, because because Shawn Michaels keeps uh, this fucking fetish of breaking up tag teams. Uh, he's finally stopped doing that. Uh, for the love of God, thank God, he finally stopped doing it. Well, watch, uh, you say that now, and then he's just going to gonna do it again, uh, you know? But he's like, in the process of already doing it with Jay-Z, so... Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just like... And Angel and, and Umberto are definitely not breaking up now, but... He finally stopped breaking up tag teams. He was breaking up a tag, one tag team every two weeks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just... They... they complete, He completely ruined this tag team. Just completely ruined them. Yeah. I'm so never going to forget, by the way. We did one, an episode of WWE Aftershock. You asked Shawn Michaels, what tag team is next? What tag team is next? The next episode of NXT, he broke up Ivy Nile and Tatum Paxley. Well, next episode type of thing. Like, no tension. No, no nothing. <laughs> I'm not going to hold back. Shawn Michaels' booking is so lazy that one of his eyes has gone lazy as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, it really is. It's really horrifically lazy booking. But anyhow, overall, I enjoyed this. I thought the match could have gone a little longer, but it felt like the match yeah. was pretty quick. But uh, I actually kind of like what they did with Miles Bourne. I like to think that this was a setup by Gulak to make it look like he was going to be a part of their team. But really, it was all just a trap, so I like to think that. Plus, Gulak, Dempsey, and Charlie Dempsey's like little, little faction they uh, they have going on. I'm sorry, wait. Damon Kemp, I said Charlie Dempsey's name twice. So, <laughs> um, but, I'm his twin. Um... <laughs> But with the same name for some reason. Charlie Dempsey. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, I they that faction needed a big win, and this was a good way for uh, them to get it. It's obviously going to be like a rematch. I think there's going to be a segment probably next week where like Fallon Henley uh, comes up to Miles Bourne and like calls him out on it type of thing. Uh, I think this is better though. Because he's deaf. <laughs> Plus this, yeah, I don't know, but. He's get, well. She, she's gonna have to like yell really loud. I guess I don't know. Like, um, but anyhow, yeah. Get, continue taking us through the show, Steve. Um, I will just say this: every time I see Charlie Dempsey, I think the same thing. How much longer until we can get Willing Regal back in NXT? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. It's uh, he's way too much of a clone of his father. It's not even funny. Yes. After this segment, we had um, or sorry, after this match, we had a segment where. Andre Chase and Duke Hudson were looking for Thea Hale. She was hanging out with J.C. Jane in the backstage area, getting trashed on by a few guys, but J.C. Jane stood up for her, and Thea said she wanted him. A makeover next week, kind of just a quick segment. Obviously, they're still going with the Thea Hale heel turn, which is interesting. It's not I good. Guess. It's not good. Um, it's not yeah. good, but it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, anyway. uh, it's pretty shitty, actually. I fucking hate every bit of it because you have a great overstable in Chase U and yeah. Shawn Michaels couldn't fucking wait, couldn't fucking wait to get his fucking grubby paws around it to break it up. He couldn't <laughs> fucking wait. He was so fucking excited. He was sitting there in the creative meeting going, okay, what are we going to do today? What's, what's, what's in the works for today? Um, how do we break up Chase U? And they're like, Sean, don't do that. Don't. We don't need to do that. No, no, we're doing it right now. <laughs> it's going to be the slowest burn in the history of professional wrestling. <laughs> and then we're going to break them up, and then everyone's going to be mad, and then we're just going to forget about it, because Duke Hudson's, Duke Hudson's going to be useless yeah. as soon as the team breaks up. And then Thea Hale, who, by the way, this tag team is, is fucking terrible, because who gives a shit about J.C. Jane? And I was like, this is like yeah. such an obvious cringe setup to where she's going to pretend like she's her friend and then she's going to turn on it. Yeah. It's so fucking completely obvious. It's fucking horrible. But, but we'll move on now. But, uh, next although time. my thought is I didn't like this either. Okay, sorry. Um, I thought this was pretty uh, terrible stuff. Um, I will say, Steve, a, jo a joke Chris and I have um, is... Uh, Anytime you're a tag team in NXT, if Shawn Michaels calls you in for a meeting, you should be, like, worried for your lives type of thing, because that means your tag team's getting broken up if Shawn Michaels calls you in to have a meeting with them type of thing. Yeah. So, uh, there you go. 
Go ask Marty Jannetty how he feels about all this. I guess in 1992, there's a team called the Rockers, and, Mar- and then no. Shawn Michaels decided he had enough, and he super kicked him in the face and threw him through a pane of glass. Yeah. And ever since that day, he's been on a vengeance. He's, he's been on his vengeance tour, and he's hated tag teams ever since then. He's hated tag teams unless they started with D and ended with X. There you go. Yes. All right. So we had next match we had with Paige, I mean Lyra Valkyrie versus Anna Brooke and Kalani Jordan. Tell me I'm wrong about that Lyra Valkyrie comment, because I'm not. Now that you've said it, I can't unsee it now. Like, um <laughs> She's she, she, it now, right? You're she's just Paige. She's Paige the <laughs> She's Paige Jr. Uh no. I could I could really start ripping on Paige right now, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> Page rather the cum shot title. Well, thanks. <laughs> I don't even think that's what Steve was going to say, but, you know, Chris went in a whole different direction. So, yeah, we had Lara Valkyrie versus Dana Brooke with Kalani Jordan. Uh, Dana Brooke is still one of the most uninteresting wrestlers on the roster. Uh, I know she has her fans out there who say, oh, no, she's just underrated. It's like, I, I, don't, really, terrible. I don't really see it. I tried to. I, I was one of those people at one point, but then I, uh, you know, actually started watching her matches. Um, yeah, it was just uh, once you've watched one match, you've seen them all. Yeah, and like the whole cr- the crowd was into it. I'll give it. I'll give her that. It was a lot of love to Dana. Dana sucks. Um, after the match, Brooke shook hands with Valkyria, but then tried to attack her. Um. Kalani Jordan stopped her from it. So, obviously, there's going to be a feud between those two at some point. Uh, as for Lyra Valkyria, I would just call her up to the main roster if they're not going to put the belt on her. But then again, once we get to the main events, maybe that match where she does get the belt could happen. Yeah, overall, uh, match was relatively fine enough, I guess. I didn't really care about it. Um, and then obviously, uh, the stuff to do with Dana Brooke, I guess, is whatever. At least she, she might be better off going heel than face, at least. Uh, that might be better. You did forget to say Lava Valkyrie ended up winning. She won with, like, the axe kick, I think, or whatever it was. Not the axe kick, but, like, yeah, the spinning back kick, so. Yeah, Chris, what did you think of this match overall and everything? Um, it's a nothing match. Just, Lyra's gonna win anyway, but, um, is it really gonna make a fucking difference whether Dana Brooke goes heel or not? Because no one's gonna fucking care about her anyway. She's been heel on the main roster before no one cared about her. She's been facing the main roster before no one cared about her. She's been tween on the main roster before no one cared about her. So what what makes a fucking difference of her going to NXT being a face and then being a heel? Doesn't make a difference. She's no one's gonna care about her anyway. We should start calling her Dana Crook because she's stolen valuable time from NXT. <laughs> she might be the wrestling thug. <laughs> Dana she is the wrestling thug. <laughs> That's where all the stealing Susan's everyone's time have been going. She's been stealing them. <laughs> Um, all right, and after this, we had Eddie Thorpe uh, in an interview where Jack appeared on a video. He was making fun of him, and I think it was hitting a tree with his belt, something like that. Yeah, this I, is- I'm still trying to get what Jack's gimmick is. He's just a bad dude, I guess, who likes to lock people up and beat them up. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Am I wrong in saying Dijak's gimmick is he likes to abduct people? <laughs> like, I mean, not wrong. <laughs> you know what he is? He's he finally seven come to life. Well, wait a minute. Can you call it an abduction, though? Because the, the talent li- goes there willingly to get beat up, though. It's really an abduction. Might be some like some sort of weird fetish that they have. Then <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for a segment where they just rip off seven and instead it's die jack in the window. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Do, do, do like a segment where like a kid's like like looking around like all terrified and you see like die jack just like slowly slithering out from under the bed. <laughs> he comes out in that Uncle Fast with a costume and then <laughs> he just reaches the hand up and. Reaches his hand up to grab the kid, then cuts to black. <laughs> do, do a segment where like a kid checks his closet, like no one's in there. He goes to shut it, and then shut it like it doesn't close all the way. And then when it reopens, hijacks in there, just traps on his jeans. <laughs> <laughs> the closet. 
<laughs> Funny thing is, I, if Shawn Michaels booked that, that'd be, able, that'd be the most entertaining thing he's probably ever booked. Like, <laughs> but he has to go like, faster and then be like, I hate this fucking gimmick. <laughs> His gimmick just becomes that he abducts people the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like someone will just be walking backstage and like you'll just see in the background like it just like chloroform rags someone and just yanks them off screen. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but remember that was uh that was Legato's gimmick actually in the beginning that they that they just killed um, Dexter Lomas for a bit. Yeah, so but overall when he, uh, uh, when he chloroformed the Miz the do dirty things with him. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and then they find out the Miz arranged for his own kidnapping, so um, yeah. <laughs> but overall, well, moving on from child abduction. Well, hey, overall, whatever he's into, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna judge him. Yeah. But overall, yeah. I, I, I like this uh, promo by Eddie Thorpe type of thing. I like uh, this feud. Actually, they've been having like really good matches. I, I think they're gonna have a, some type of stipulation match at No Mercy. I don't know what it's gonna be, but it seems like it's going in that yeah. direction. The o- the only thing you miss is they also announced the. NXT Women's Breakout Tournament is going to be happening again. It says it's coming soon. We don't know what, exactly when it's going to happen. I imagine it's probably going to be after No Mercy, just because uh, I don't think they have enough time to do the tournament before. I mean, they were barely able to squeeze in this Heritage Cup tournament. Uh, they had to put some right. of the matches on level up. But overall, uh, yeah. What do you think of this Eddie Thorpe promo, Chris? Because uh, we spent so much time talking about abductions and everything like that. So, <laughs> um, It's fine. Uh, I like Eddie Thorpe. Um... Yeah, I, I hope he wins. Yeah, he should win. He should win, but at the same time, Dijak needs to fucking win badly. Well, he has beat him twice in a row, though. So it's like you know, at least he's got that going for him. So then Eddie Thorpe wins them. There you go. All right, good old TR. <laughs> yep. Uh, moving on, though, we had the Global Heritage Invitational: Tyler Bate versus Axiom. It's a pretty uh, decent match. I thought it was. Um, let's see my notes right here. Yeah, so Bate did wind up defeating Axiom in the match by pinfall to earn two points in the Heritage Cup. I thought it was a good match overall. I uh, think Butch comes out after. He's like shown backstage after because they were doing wa- they were doing like a yeah, watch party backstage with all the participants in the cup. For some reason, yeah, he's uh, calling out bait, basically warning them like not to underestimate him and stuff. Uh, overall, I love I love the match. I love Tyler Bate. I love Axiom. I love Butch being back in NXT. Um, they really really need to drop the Butch crap and just start calling him. Uh, well, I'm drawing a freaking blank. Pete Dunn. Re- Pete Dunn. Pete Dunn. Thank you. Yeah, he's bringing back to Pete Dunn. Uh, the only thing I don't like about the Heritage Cup thing right now is just Noam Dar is so uninteresting. Everyone he's associated with is uninteresting. The metaphor is just a complete waste of my Tuesday night, honestly. I can't, I can't blame you for that. Yeah, overall, I thought this match was very exciting. I wish this was just what the Heritage Cup was, was this uh, was that these were the rules instead of what they actually are type of thing. Um, yeah. Obviously, it made sense for Tyler Bate to get the win because he needed to get on the scoreboard type of thing. Uh, Axiom, I thought, looked really good here. Um, he looked really strong in defeat. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I liked the Pete Dunn promo afterwards where he just uh, ragged on Tyler Bate type of thing and everything like that. I like the fact that they brought up the history and all that type of stuff. It's always really weird that they brought up the history, but, like, he wasn't... He was Pete Dunne, like, when he was doing that type of thing. So it's like they can't really show it, obviously, because, you know, they would have to, like, edit out the Pete Dunne name and everything like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I feel like we're definitely... Even though he's kept the name and everything like that... By the way, Steve, the reason I can't say the name is once I say the name, I'm stuck to that name forever. Chris and I have an agreement on that. That's why, like, certain people have been calling them the names that they are now because I've screwed up and called them that name by accident, so... But Pete Dunn, um, uh, slowly but surely. But uh, Pete Dunn overall, um, you know, I think it's back to my end of the Pete Dunn thing. Uh, but yeah, I've 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 liked the Heritage Club Global Invitational type of thing. I like that we got to see like a G one style tournament, uh, at least on the WWE level. I kind of hope that since NXT kind of did it now, WWE maybe will um, at least try it type of thing. 
It's stuff to do with really different. Right. Yeah, but they've never done like a this format of a tournament though. Uh, type of yeah. thing. It's usually like a it's a round robin that it's called type of thing where you get eliminated type of thing. Or well, I forget what it's called, right. but um, but yeah. So there you go. What did you think of yeah, it? I'd be okay with that. You go, Chris. Ah, uh, this match was really. This match was great. There's just so, so much chemistry between them. Uh, even going back to to um, NXT UK when Axiom was a kid, like they had just had so much chemistry together. Um, it was a great match. I loved it. Yeah, I was gonna say I'd love to see the King of the Ring tournament in the future become more of a round robin style tournament like this is. Yeah, definitely. All right, then next up we had the Creed Brothers versus Malik Blade and let's see if I get this name right, Idris Anoff. Uh, Idris Anoffe, but you were close, and it's Malik, okay. it's it's Malik Blade, Malik. Malik Blade. I mean, uh, we all know when I can't get the names right, who probably won the match. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. You kept calling the you kept, Brothers. You kept calling the Wyatt family the Watch for years, and I think they won most of the matches ah. in NXT. So. Rest in, rest in peace, Gray Watts. The wrestling electricians. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> uh, I'm. I'm not gonna beat the de- I'm not gonna beat that horse anymore. But uh, when you're carrying out an electric lantern every night, you're sending false advertisement. He should have done that at some point. Just start smacking people with the lantern. I think he did once, didn't he? Maybe. Um, no, that was a TV that exploded. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, Creed Brothers won the match. Uh, nothing too out of the ordinary for the match, but it was the Creed Brothers, so you know, you're always in for a good uh, entertainment value there. But um, they won with the uh, Brutus Bomb for the win, a pinfall. Uh, we had Angel Garza and Umberto Carrillo watching closely. And it's definitely setting up for something down the line with those two. Maybe the rumors are true and LWO call-up could happen for those two. Yeah, they become like, part of LWO and NXT. I'd like that. I, I, would, I would actually be okay if they drove the joke even further and started calling them the LWO B team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, Hank Walker and Tank Ledger uh, were staring down the Creed Brothers, but they got blindsided by Lucian Price and Brock Wanima. You got those names so, right. Yeah, I did. They're still probably going to lose, but, you know. They're relevant. Sense. Yeah, so the, the tag division right now is just kind of in that state of everyone's trying to beat the hell out of each other and just see where it goes. Yeah, overall, I thought this was, uh, you know, a relatively, like, good match. It's a very fast-paced match. I think they, like, realized they were running out of time, so they, they had to get all this stuff in really fast. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, overall, but overall, I still thought they did it well enough. Um, and, yeah, I, I liked, I think Garza and uh, Carrillo, I don't know if they'll win the belts, but I think they're going to end up being the next team that challenges uh, for the NXT tag titles. I think that's going to be the No Mercy match. And then... Uh, I, I like Tanky Tanky and Bronco Nemo and Lucian Price being out there. I realize if you watched their promo last week, Price and Nemo are not ready to be on TV yet. Um, I think they shouldn't cut promos at least, anyways. But uh, they kind of ruined that tag team. And I know you're gonna say they only just got up there, but they've been up there like a month now, and they haven't done like they haven't done anything. They they lost their first match, and that was basically it for them because they they can't even challenge for the belts because they did everything they would have done in the match. In the match right. before they won the belt, so it's like, okay, so what, they can't really even do anything, really. But, yeah, Chris, what did you think of all this stuff? Eh. 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 Doesn't really hold my interest all that much, but Creed Brothers winning, yeah, uh, makes sense. Um, yeah, but it's just just a bunch of clustery fuckery. And by the way, I want to I want to mention one more thing. By the way, because we should just talk about how big of a waste now. By the way, that losers leave stipulation match. I think you were going to get to it, Steve, but I'll just talk about it now. Ava and Joe Gacy were cutting a promo outside, talking about how like 
the trees or whatever, the th the whole thing that they say are, like, falling down. Basically, the empire is crumbling because uh, Grizzly Nun veterans are out of contract now. They didn't resign with WWE. Um, so then I do have to ask, if this was just going to happen anyways, why didn't they just lose the, lose the Loser Leaves NXT match if they were going to end up being the ones off of NXT anyways? Like, it, it seemed like they tried their best to keep them, so that's probably yeah. why they didn't lose, but it's like, you know, if you knew they were going to... Because gonna... Michael Stone Hickenbottom can't run a fucking show properly. <laughs> but anyhow, what did you think of that segment? I thought, I thought for a bit Triple H was... Saw the writing on the wall that we've all clearly seen with Michaels and his hatred of tag teams, and he was trying to get the Creed Brothers out of NXT. But yeah, apparently not. I don't get why they shouldn't be in NXT anymore. They're good. Yeah, but what did you think of the Joe Gacy Ava promo and uh, Good Night Veterans being gone now type of thing? Well, I mean, Good Night Veterans probably going to AEW more than likely. Yeah, they might be. I would prefer Impact just because I think they'd be a bit, they'd be more focused on Impact. They wouldn't get a, as much money, obviously, as going into AEW, but at least they can get their name out there again because it's going to take a while, too, f to, for them to forget that they were, like, kind of being used like crap and all that type of stuff in WWE yeah. towards the end. But we'll see. What did you think, Chris, of the Skizzens promo and I guess what's next for them since there's no more Grizzly and Young Veterans? Uh, they're useless. Um, they've been useless for a long time. Um, their best bet for it to keep to keep both uh, Gibson and Drake was to put them on the main roster. That was their best bet, and they fucking completely ruined it. Shit. They completely fucking ruined it. They lost them. So what? Like, and just, good job. Just put this picture in your mind. You know, here's here's Triple H's hand coming to grab him, and Sean is just grabbing him, and he's like, "No, no, I want them to leave." And the biggest, the funniest thing... Right, yeah, their legs back down just so we can break them up. And the funniest thing uh, I think that's happened is right when Triple H took over, he got Fabian Agnew up there with Imperium and before he was doing the modeling gimmick in NXT type of thing. And because Vince was still running the show and Triple H became the, the head creative and he was like, yeah, we need to get Imperium back together. There's no reason he should be down there by himself. Yeah. Like, I, thought that, I think that's awesome. I definitely agree. Uh, next, we had a Global Heritage Invitational match. Nathan Fraser versus Akira Tozawa. We were talking about Tozawa earlier, how he seems to just have bad luck. That didn't change because Fraser defeated Tozawa by pinfall to earn two points. Uh, he won with the uh, superplex into a Falcon Arrow. Definitely reminiscent of his uh, master, Seth Rollins. Yep. And they and, said... Uh, his coach, trainer... Yeah, overall, uh, think, uh, overall was a good match. Um, you know, no surprise to Zara losing and Fraser winning. After the match, uh, Joe Coffey was talking trash about Duke Hudson until he showed up and warned Gallus that he was, you know, ready for him. He was coming for him. I think it was after this they had the Joe Gacy Ava promo, actually. Oh, Maybe. okay, okay. But overall, I thought this was relatively uh, good stuff. Um, I liked the match. Tozawa pretty much can't win the thing now. I think he's had all his matches in his block now, and he didn't get a win. So there's yeah. that. I think there's. Uh, I think Nathan Fraser can't win it now either. I think uh, he. I think that he can tie it at least. Because uh, the big thing with the Joe Gacy, Duke Hudson match is if Gacy wins, he wins the block. If uh, you know, Duke Hudson wins, it's a three way tie. Um, they're trying to make it seem like, though, it's like a must-win for Gacy, by the way. Like, he has to win this match to advance in the tournament, but he doesn't have to win the match, though, because if he ties it, he still wins the, he still wins his block, because it's, you get, it's, each people get, each person gets one point if they, uh, tie it, and I'm pretty sure, I think, Duke Hudson's only got two points, so he would, he, he, so, like, that didn't even make any sense, like, they're like, oh, no, it's a must-win next week for Gacy, if he doesn't win, then you can just forget it, like, I don't get that, but how is it a must win if, uh, you know, if, if he can just tie it? Like, that doesn't really make sense. Like, right. Um, I feel, it feels, I, th it's, I think Vic Joseph and Booker T weren't really, didn't really, I think, forgot the rules or something. And let's be real, it's probably Booker T definitely forgot the rules. I was going to say, I think we know which one forgot. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, I, I liked the match. I just didn't really like how they, how they explained the Joe Coffey do cuts and then because like it, it, it doesn't really because it's Vaughn. It doesn't make sense. But anyhow, right. Chris, what did you think of the match and how did you feel about how they explained the do cuts? Do cuts? Do cuts and Joe Coffey. Do cuts me. Yeah, he's do cuts now. Just fine. All of it was okay. Okay. Didn't really have any issues with it. Okay. There you go. All right. After this, we had, yeah, we had the Joe Gacy of Rain promo. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, Mustafa Ali refusing to admit that Dominic Mysterio gave him a fast count. Even in the face of Dragon Lee, I mean, that is what it is. Any thoughts? Anybody? Um, relatively good stuff. You know, uh, I thought it made a lot of sense to keep Dragon Lee out of it because obviously Dom doesn't want to face him since, you know, Dragon Lee has a pinfall on him. He's just afraid he'd lose his belt type of thing. Um... I like the fact that they're continuing the Mustafa Ali like heel direction type of thing. This is a gimmick that the gimmick that he's doing now is a gimmick he tried to pitch to Vince, but Vince denied it. So I like the fact that he gets to finally do the gimmick that he wanted to do on the main roster in NXT now. I think the uh, he's definitely turning after the match. I just think y'all obviously uh, he's a he's definitely a tweener right now, mainly because he's feuding with Dom. Everyone just hates Dom so much that I think whoever goes against him is obviously the babyface. So I think that's what's going on yeah. right here. So anything you want to say, Chris? Um, no, not really. I mean, Anyone who goes against Dom is friends. Our Neil. Yeah, because they've been built into it for like a while. Because uh, it seems like it always happens, and then either like um, plant crea creative changes, or uh, and that's basically the only reason he hasn't gone full heel because creative keeps changing, type of thing. So. Pretty much, and then after that, we had Gigi Dolan and Blair Davenport fighting backstage uh, until that got broken up. No, no comments from me on that. It's, it's a feud, and it's going to happen. I didn't mind it too much. The thing I didn't like about it is it took place like right after the Wesley, like him leaving NXT thing, and I thought that kind of took away the, from the emotion we were supposed to feel for right. Matt. I felt like that could have happened earlier, or at least after they came back from break or something. How'd you feel about this, Chris? Um. I could say, uh, I mean, it's at least going to maybe be good for both of them. I just don't know because this is not what Gigi should be doing. It's a fucking joke that she's even, like, in these type of feuds. She should be feuding. She should have been champion by now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, insane to me that she has so much fucking talent. And they, were, they keep pushing and, and they keep having to lose every fucking time. So fucking stupid. She's so irrelevant in this company right now. It's just one of the best they have, period. Agreed. Oh, man, maybe uh, that'll change soon. Because now we are on to our main event, the NXT Women's Championship match. Champion Tiffany Stratton defending against Becky Lynch. I thought the build-up to this match was great. Just Becky, I know, were being like, yeah, I'll come to NXT, like... Nothing in my contract says I can't. It's like, okay. Uh, I definitely think this was Tiffany Stratton's best match to date, and that's because of who she was in the ring with. Um, she went for the prettiest moonsault ever, uh, but well, she missed it. And then after that, Becky was able to rebound and hit her uh, man the uh, manhandle slam to win the match. That's the uh, premise of the end there. But the match itself was pretty decent, like I said. Uh, there was a lot of up-close-and-personal action. Tiffany was definitely pushed to her limit. But seeing Becky Lynch win was awesome. Uh, normally, I'm against main roster people going down and winning the belt from the younger talent. But Tiffany Stratton was just so awful that I said I would literally anyone be champion it rather than her. And... Becky Lynch meets that criteria of being anyone other than her. Mm -hmm. There's really no, no way to go other than that. And I don't think Tiffany's, I pray Tiffany Stratton is not getting called up. Yeah, she's not I ready to be. I pray that doesn't happen. She needs to stay in NXT and develop longer or go somewhere else. Yeah. To get that, but um, no, Becky Lynch winning the belt is good actually because it does open up the possibility for a lot of matches for her to put other people over. I don't see Becky being champion for very long, 
I think uh, Lara Valkyria may be the person to dethrone her down the line. But overall, I thought the match was pretty decent. How about you, Chris? I thought this. I thought this match was really good. Um, I just fucking hope that this isn't uh, Tiffany Stratton getting called up because it would be a, it'd fucking be awful because she's fucking atrocious, atrocious, and should not be called up. She's nowhere near ready. Especially because there's more people right now that are ready that haven't been called up yet. Oh, be, yeah. um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, overall, I really liked this match. Uh, I definitely think it had to do with the fact that, you know, Tiffany was in the room with Becky. I thought Tiffany did win it a little bit. I think she realized, you know, she's in the room with Becky. She can't really screw up anything type of thing. And also, uh, this was probably going to be the most viewed she was ever going to have, like, anyone watch her matches type of thing. So I think she realized that. Um, there was time to take the title off Tiffany. You know, uh, I like the fact that Becky Lynch is going to be NXT Women's Champion. I think that it's going to help the division a lot because I think the NXT Women's uh, division has been kind of, you know, struggling ever since. Because uh, I think I mentioned this to Chris. We haven't had a good NXT Women's Champion really since uh, Raquel uh, Gonzalez because uh, Ro- Ro- Roxanne Perez had a potential to be good. But then, uh, you know, obviously uh, the book, it wasn't really the strongest behind her and all that type of stuff. So, yeah. Um, hey, not not to rag on like people who have like legitimate mental health issues, but her whole gimmick was I have anxiety, yay! That's what it was, yeah. You notice know, that they they haven't brought it up recently since uh, that story. They kind of dropped that storyline. That just shows you it wasn't very. <laughs> they good. haven't brought up at all. Yeah, so like that's literally what her entire gimmick was at one point. And uh, yeah, but Becky Lynch being champion, I think it could be a great thing. I think. Uh, She's essentially going to be Dom, who probably bounces back and forth between Raw and NXT and, you know, defends the belt, except obviously she should do it in a babyface way instead of a heel type of way. And, uh, you know, when WWE mentioned that they were going to make NXT a third brand, I think they finally accomplished that now. I think uh, they've always mentioned it before, and obviously nothing ever comes of it, because usually uh, when Vince was the one really running things type of thing, like he would just lose interest in it really quickly. It seems like Triple H and Shawn Michaels, at least the thing they're going to agree on, is they're going to finally make... NXT a viable third brand, and I think that's helped NXT because uh, for like a good month or so, maybe even two months before, uh, you know, uh, stand and deliver and all that type of stuff, I thought NXT was like the worst show of the week type of thing, Um, so I'm glad that, uh, you know, um, Shawn Michaels still can't book, which I think affected uh, the product type of thing, but I think what's helping NXT right now is the fact that, you know, Essentially, the main roster guys coming down there and, you know, making it a type of viable type of thing. Because weirdly enough, it seems like the main roster guys have more creative control than the rookies type of thing. Because uh, any storyline there seems to be good, except for Dana Brooke yeah. storylines. Um, and then, uh, you know, all the ones, the rookies that are in, except for maybe like Carmelo Hayes and like Wesley and stuff, uh, you know, really isn't particularly the greatest thing in the world. Um, I get, you know, right. obviously the rookies and stuff like that, but it's like, you know, if you don't have the writer behind you, uh, you can't make anything good type of thing sometimes. Right. So, overall, I'm happy Becky Lynch is NXT uh, Women's Champion. I'm looking forward to seeing what she does. I'd imagine the person that will dethrone her is either going to be whoever wins the breakout tournament, um, which I don't even know if you can, if you can get someone ready that quick because typically it's rookies that compete in there. Like, when I say rookies, it's like people who are just debuting in the promotion. Or I could see someone like, uh, like you said, Lyra Valkyria, or this is where Roxanne Perez, because I think Roxanne Perez might be going here. It seems uh, she's acted very more, much more aggressive and all that type of stuff, and her promos have been fairly heelish lately. So yeah, I hope it's not like Core J coming back and like <clears throat> beating her for the belt type of thing. Unless she's a baby face, then that would be okay with that. But um, but yeah, uh, with her enhancements. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's true. But anyhow, uh, yeah. He was enhancing her talent. She was. She is truthfully a very good enhancement talent now. <laughs> but yeah, that's NXT. Uh, what does everyone give NXT for like a letter grade? We'll start with Steve since he's going to leave soon. So I can't in good faith give NXT an A until Shawn Michaels leaves the creative room. So we'll go with a B plus and... Literally, the whole show could have been terrible, but the fact that Tiffany Stratton is no longer NXT Women's Champion makes it a B plus. I, I, 
The show I thought was still really good anyways. Like, I know, obviously, the Wesley uh, Ilya Dragunov match was a banger. Um, the Global yeah. Heritage Cup matches were great. And, you know, they did some great promos throughout the show. Um, but so I'm going to go a B-plus also. What about you, Chris? Uh, I'm going to go B-plus, too. Um, the opener, again, NXT has this problem where it's like the opener is... The opening match is usually great. And then the main event's usually really fucking good. And this. In the middle, there's bits and pieces that are good. But, like, the main event was the only reason why people turned, tuned into the fucking show. Yeah. Be honest. The only reason why people were watching, the only reason why I got over a million is because, uh, just because of, uh, Halen. That's the only reason why people were watching. You had yeah. the advertiser a week in advance, and boom, look what happens. Yeah. If it was Tiffany Stratton versus Keanu James in the main event, no one give a rat's ass. I mean, this prove your point. They they put him in the opener last week, and they didn't have any entrances or anything like that type of thing. It was the match didn't even go. I don't even think ten minutes. So <laughs> yeah, it was it was not good. But don't worry, the crowd was into it, as in they loved shitting on it. Oh, they did, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's like uh, Booker T versus Buff Bagwell. On the uh, Raw main event. The crowd was into it. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, very into it. And anyhow, Steve, uh, you've reviewed all the shows you needed to review. You, you Is there anything you want to plug or promote? I will be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. There you go. He'll be back. And remember the infamous words of Ready to Rumble... Remember what a diamond upside down is. A pussy. <laughs> <laughs> diamond upside down is a pussy. <laughs> we will see you. Yeah, <laughs> Alright, take it easy, guys. We'll see you later. Right, on the show, and I will be back. Why do I... Oh, hold on, I gotta... Oh, hold on, he messed, he messed up the whole thing. Um, Luck up... Uh, so we have to stop the recording for a second because, uh, uh, I mean, yeah. I, we're both in the shot, I guess, because it's just me, because we, we're not in video, I'm in the video at least, and at least, uh, you know, you're not on camera anyway, so it's, it, it, yeah. it, it will benefit us. I think we'll be okay. It will live. We'll, we'll survive. Yeah, because the screen recorded things, like, recorded half of the, like, not half of the screen, but, you know. Um, but yeah, let's just, uh, yeah. I'm gonna. Th I'm just gonna cover level up now, just because uh, you know, that's taped the same day as NXT, anyways. And then I'll cover the bump, and then I'll cover. You can take SmackDown. So is okay. Level up. That took place on September fifteenth, two thousand twenty-three. We had the commentary team of Byron Saxton and uh, Blake Howard. We had the opener. It was uh, Danny Palmer and Tatum Packley versus Last Legend and Jakaro Jackson. Uh, relatively okay match here. They got the heat on, uh, Tatum Paxley for a while, and then Danny Palmer got the hot tag. And, so predictably enough, when Danny Palmer was in trouble, she went for a tag, and, uh, Tatum Paxley turned on her. She, uh, you know, you know, got off the apron and everything like that. I was even thinking to myself and everything like that, you know, this tag team's got potential and everything like that. Shawn Michaels couldn't even wait till they made it to the main show. They he they he just had them turn on each other and level up the first match in. So you know, uh, couldn't. That's another tag team. He just te he he technically broke up before they even had a chance to even really be a tag team right there, Chris. So, um, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, apparently there's a reason that this is happening. Apparently Tatum Paxley said that uh, Danny Palmer did something. We don't know what it is. They didn't tell us what it was, but she's doing, th doing this for a reason. I imagine all that's going to come from this is they'll just have like a match um, in a few weeks on Level Up where Tatum Paxley will lose and right back. she'll go right back to the house show circuit. So, um, yeah, it's whatever. Afterwards, uh, Last Legend and Jacoba Jackson hit like a wheelbarrow uh, cutter. Uh, combination on uh, Danny Palmer for the win, so you know this was kind of this was whatever. Then we had um, Tyson Dupont and uh, Tywick Igwe get interviewed. They just talked about how they're going to win the match tonight, and then they faced Blanco Lima and Lucian Price. 
They don't win. Uh, relatively good match here. They just kind of ruined Brock Nima and Lucian Price. They don't really matter anymore. They're right back to level up. They can't even get on the show anymore. And they beat and they beat um, one of the guys with a uh, spine buster. I think it was Tyreek Equi. But I think Tyson Dupont and Tyreek Equi do have potential. I think they'll probably do to show up on TV soon just to have Shawn Michaels screw that up also. So, you know, there you go. Um, then we had the main event. It was uh, the NXT Global Heritage Cup match. It's uh, Tyler Bate versus Charlie Dempsey. This was good, but you could definitely tell they had to hold back because this was taped the same day as NXT, and I think they realized Tyler Bate was going to have to come out and wrestle again, so they couldn't really do anything crazy here. So I hope they can have like a rematch where they can really go all out, but Tyler Bate won with a roll-up, and he now he has two points in the, um, in the Invitational. Uh, so if he beats... Um, Pete Dunne, uh, in the finals on Tuesday, of his block anyways, I think he pretty much wins his block, um, so, he, so he'll advance, so we'll see if that happens, um, but, yeah, overall, relatively good episode of Level Up, I enjoyed it, uh, I enjoyed, uh, the, the men's tag match, and I enjoyed Tyler Bate versus Charlie Dempsey, uh, so I'll give, like, I'll give it, like, a B minus. I think it's definitely helped having the, uh, Global Heritage Cup matches go on Level Up for a few weeks, it's made it matter. You could say though this is on the bit Shawn Michaels because he booked this tournament and he can't even book he can't even get most of the tournament on TV because he waited too long to finally start doing the matches. Like what was he thinking doing that? Um but yeah there's a, there's only like three matches I think left in the Global Heritage Cup. I think it's uh no, the two matches and I'm pretty sure um Axiom and uh Charlie Dempsey still have to have a match because I don't think they've had a match yet. I don't, get, I don't get the point of that, though, because, like, they can't even win the tournament at this point, type of thing. I know you're going to say they do this in sports all the time, but it doesn't really make sense. Like, why bother? They can't, they can't even win it anymore. Like, um, you could say they can play spoiler, but they're, they're so far down in the points, they can't even play spoiler. What's the point of having the match? Like, um, yeah. I know you're going to say they do this in sports all the time, type of thing, but it's like, they can't even do it. It doesn't help anybody if they even have this match. There's no point. They should just do a town out there where Charlie Dempsey just leaves type of thing. Just because there's no like there's no point of even yeah. having this match type of thing. Like, um, I don't get it. What do you think about right. that? I mean, I I want your take on that because I know you see this happen in sports a lot, anyways. But I feel like this is kind of a dumb. We this is a dumb. We I don't know why they even bought. They should have booked this match at least like first if they weren't even gonna have him get foul in the tournament type of thing. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's. It is what it is. I mean, they shouldn't have had the match anyway because he's they're way out of point contention anyway. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like you're gonna be less critique because they know this happens in sports all the time. I think why it's bad here because they can prevent this from happening type of thing. Like they, you know, like this is one of the benefits of booking type of thing. I think Shawn Michaels like. Just, I don't understand this. Like he, and I think he realized he could he could have made this spent. He could have used the fact that you know wrestling's, like, all scripted and all that type of stuff to his advantage, but he's just like, well, this could happen in sports type of thing. It's like, yeah, there's a reason why this doesn't happen in wrestling, because it's stupid. So, um, it's just like... Yeah. Because no one's going to get into this match, because everyone's just going to be like, well, they can't win it now. Like, it's, what's the point? You what's know? the point? Yeah. Um, you should just cancel the match. Just be like, yeah, you guys can't... Or they should do something where, like, like they'll get extra points if they win if one of them wins type of thing or something type of thing. Like get yeah, fifty points for the wins of the winner. Can you imagine that? By the way, they were both losing the tournament type of thing. Um, well, actually, I am wrong about something. There actually there actually is a reason they can have this match because uh, if Pete Dunn um, and Tyler Bate go no, that doesn't because Pete Dunn still wins. I was just say if they go to a tie, but Pete Dunn still wins because he's already got three points. So. Uh, they should. They, I feel like they kind of screwed up the point system too. They should have made it like, you know, if you win, you get two points, and if you uh, tie, you get one point. Because that kind of, I think that screwed them. All, that kind of hurt them in the long run. I think. But whatever. It's Shawn Michaels booking. You know, it's uh, not meant to make sense. Well, it should make sense, but because she, that's isn't that kind of bad, by the way, too. That's how we have to just justify logic to the booking of NXT. It's Shawn Michaels booking, so it doesn't make sense type of thing. Like, you know. It's just like whatever. Like that. Um, but anyhow, you want to take us through uh, SmackDown? Yeah, I'm going to try my best to be focused right now, but there's a lot of shit going on right now. 
I know, and this is a big SmackDown you got to cover right here. I know, yeah. Uh, BC's playing right now. And I'm like, I, while you were doing that, I was like screaming to myself. You could have just muted your mic, dude. Yeah, I, I could do that, but. Oh, this thing pisses me off. Um, this, but, is why uh, gonna, this is why you're gonna get a DVR because you could pause. You could pause it. Well, I do have a DVR, but it's it's not worth pausing. Yeah. <laughs> you're just gonna have to. So this is gonna be an interesting experiment right here, then. It is. I gotta stay focused. Hey, blame Steve for this because he's the reason. I missed the ball back. Here, so. Yeah, blame Steve for this because he's the reason I missed SmackDown last night. We could have been doing this earlier in the morning. So, um. fucking Steve. Yeah. I don't know why we even have him back in the first place. Just kidding, Steve. We all love you. Actually, no, we don't. But yeah, take us through SmackDown. I like how you mentioned. Uh, I like how you mentioned we're trying to get through this. You're trying not to get distracted. A lot of stuff going on, and I'm I, I'm the one that's being distracted, changing the subject, and everything like that. Like. <laughs> okay, so uh, the show. So this is an interesting backstory. So, SmackDown last night was in Denver, Colorado. Pat McAfee was having his the Pat McAfee show, which is on ESPN. He had that in Boulder, Colorado, where the site of College Game Day was this morning, and The Rock was on this morning doing College Game Day. And they, in Denver's only an hour drive away from from Boulder, because it's a big Colorado Colorado State game. And they chose to be there because um, Pat McAfee's on College Game Day, so uh, they did the show in Boulder the, the night before, uh, where Raw uh, SmackDown was in Denver. Pat McAfee shows up to open the show, welcomes everyone to SmackDown. Uh, just everyone's going crazy because it's been a long time since we've seen Pat, probably since like WrestleMania. I think it's been since we've seen, since we've seen Pat. Um, probably won't see him again for quite a while, just because uh, don't, because of college week day and don't say anything because you keep saying that and he show he keeps showing up. So I feel like I mean, it was I feel it like, was only an hour drive away, so it's not. Like but I feel like you can't say anything when it comes to wrestlers not showing up. Don't forget what happened with John Cena, at Money in the Bank this year type of thing. By the way, I'm like an heir of good news. <laughs> I've maybe the fact that you said that makes me think he's gonna show up because every time you say that a wrestler will just show up randomly out of nowhere. And there was a point you didn't even talk anymore. Like your cousin started asking about if the Rock's gonna show up at Money in the Bank, and you're just like, I don't want to say anything now. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's I'm, I'm a pair of good news. But um, so he's helping the crowd up, saying that SmackDown's the best, and. He, I, I will say this about Pat, he looked like he was high as shit. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he really did. He, um, he also made references to uh, Colorado being a weed-friendly state, which was actually really fucking funny. As he said, he was he was visiting the local, um, what the fuck he, uh, whatever the fuck he called it. Yeah, I forget what it was. The, um... The, f- the local stores or whatever he called it. He called it something else, which is really funny. Because he was high as shit, you could tell. Um, I probably couldn't tell. I don't think I could tell because I was still waking up and after being up, you know, because I was up early this morning. So I, I don't really think I could tell. So It's, it's yeah. It, you probably couldn't tell if you weren't paying attention. But if you looked at his eyes, his eyes were fucking... But now that you... Now that you t- now that you said that, with some of the stuff he says in his promos, it makes more sense, though. So <laughs> it does. Um, and up came Austin Theory, and they traded uh, jabs back and forth, and uh, Pat McAfee starts talking about um, the people, and right away. I knew exactly who he was talking about when he started bringing up the people and out came the fucking rock. And I was like, holy shit. Uh, it was a genuine surprise. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew he was on the Pat McAfee show earlier. I didn't realize that he was going to be a guest picker in college game day this morning, but he, I thought he was just going to do the Pat McAfee show and then dip out, go back to uh, Hollywood or whatever. 
But uh, it was a genuine fucking surprise. I, I literally, I was like, "Holy shit, no way!" Like this is fucking awesome. It was. It had been, it had been fucking years since we've seen him in any capacity in WWE. It has been so fucking long since we've seen him in a WWE ring. It's not even funny. I can't even tell you the last time we saw him in a WWE ring. It's been so long. I think it was definitely before the pandemic because I don't think he's been on since. Like I don't think he's been on since the pandemic. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So remember the, the was, it, was it? Was it? Was it Raw in Brooklyn when he made fun of uh, Lana and Miro? No, I think it was the SmackDown when they first went to Fox when he did the segment with Ken Corbin. So it was like him and oh, Beck. That might have been, been twenty eighteen then. No, that was twenty nineteen because SmackDown didn't go to Fox till twenty nineteen. Because if you remember, yeah. uh, Kofi was WWE champion in the main event, so it would have yeah. been twenty nineteen. No, it's like four years have been blended together. It's really tough to tell sometimes. Well, I remember, shit goes down quickly. Like, um, AW starts up, um, and then the pandemic hits. Not If you think about it, the pandemic hits not long after that SmackDown. So it's like, you know. Um, yeah, because they, 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 it was the season premiere of SmackDown. It was like in September, I think, or October. Yeah, and then um, I think it was and on. And then they moved the center in March. Yeah, so, if you think about it, that's really crazy to think about, like, um, you could, you could make an argument if SmackDown wasn't on, because we talked about how this didn't happen, if that didn't happen, I know we're getting way in, way out of this, but if SmackDown wasn't on Fox, Roman might not have turned, because I think it was, it, it that would have been a, that investment would not have been worth Fox's time, because, uh, you know, SmackDown was pretty bad, if you remember, um, on Fox, like everyone was thinking it was going to change to a sports focused show, and that did not happen. Vince started spending all his time writing SmackDown, which you could tell when Vince spends a lot of time writing one show, uh, that show gets greatly affected. And then, yeah. um, I'm pretty sure that was when Eric Bischoff was meant to be the head writer, but then uh, obviously that never materialized for obvious reasons. Because he didn't watch the product prior. Yeah, and so then. He had no idea what the fuck was going on. I think Vince kept changing the show on him for, I remember, like the last minute. Uh, you know, what he does now, pretty much, except, uh, you know. And then, um, yeah, then the pandemic hit, like, right when SmackDown started getting relatively good again. And, uh, again, like, if it wasn't, I think, I, we t we could talk about all the other reasons Roman probably did turn here, and probably all of those are true. We've never really noticed this. I think if SmackDown wasn't on Fox, who even knows if Roman ever would have even become the Tribal Chief, just because I think they would, yeah. I think, I think Fox had to push... WWE a little bit to be like, yeah, you need to do something here, type of thing. Um, and I will say this, too, about um, about The Rock and Roman Reigns. They had a handshake agreement last year to do WrestleMania 39. I think it was this past WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, and they had a handshake agreement that it was going to be, they were going to main event WrestleMania in, uh, the next year. I think it was the ship's 39, I believe, right, right? I believe it was 39. I think next year's 40, right? In Philly? Yeah, next year's Philly, yeah. So they had a handshake agreement in 2022, beginning of 2022, and it fell apart, obviously. But that was going to be the main event of WrestleMania 39. It wasn't going to be Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns. It was going to be The Rock versus Roman Reigns. And that all fell apart at the last second. Um... It would be interesting to see what they do. Uh, don't want to see Cody get pushed out, but if if it happens again, if they get back on the get back to it again, I wouldn't mind seeing Rock versus Roman. Um, I have a caveat. I know this probably. I know this isn't going to happen. But if they do the match at the Rumble, so that way Cody at least can get his. Well, don't forget they have two nights now, by the way, too. So Cody could still. Oh, yeah. So Cody could still factor in. They could just have Roman, you know, main event both nights. Um, oh, yeah, you can do it easy. You can main event, main event both nights, once against Rock and once and once against Cody. Night two be Cody, night, be, night one be The Rock. Yeah. Because that's the thing, too. Uh, if Roman... Because if they do Roman versus Rock type of thing, like, um, you know Roman's most likely going to win. Um, you know. That's fine. I mean, 
I mean, I'm fine with he, that. It's just like I don't think we can take another year with Roman having the belt. We we kind of we were pa- we were patient this year just because uh, you know uh, it ended up benefiting Cody in the long run and everything like that. But like uh, there's no, especially too with how less Roman's been on recently. It's like how can you can't push the storyline any further? Like you um, really can't. It's really run its. I mean, it's, it's ca- starting to lose some steam. Yeah, because they're starting to go, but but. Do. Yeah, so I'm kind of hoping that, uh, you know, um, yeah, the best bet is either do the two-night mania thing, maybe have, uh, you know, um, I don't really want to see a tie in the Rumble, though, because I'm going to say do a tie in the Rumble, because I'm one of the very few people that don't like the fact they did a tie in the 94 Rumble, but maybe have Walk win the Rumble, and then maybe have, like, a chamber match with a, uh, or something. I don't even know, like, um, I mean, with the Saga after strike, it's pretty much you can. I think you can convince Rock to because it's you, there's, there's no fucking end in sight for this thing. Yeah, so, you could convince Rock to come in and do three pay per views. I mean, I would do. Um, we we put it, we pitched the Survivor Series match, which we can't even. What's that match can't even happen now because the Usos on a team anymore. But yeah, um, you could do you could do Royal Rumble, have him in the Rumble, like you said. Yeah, and then. You could have them, um, maybe elimination chamber. Whatever fit. if it's in the like Saudi or something, have them. That would be a big draw in Saudi, and then yeah. WrestleMania. Yeah, and then uh, maybe Cody wins the chamber or something. He says he doesn't want to fight Seth for the belt. He wants to fight Roman because that's his, that's the end of the story. It's just tough though because then like if Cody wins the chamber type of thing, you really can't have him just be like, no, I don't want to go after Seth's belt because that makes the world heavyweight title look bad. If Cody says I don't want to go for that title, like it would make sense, but like sometimes, yeah. but it would make the world heavyweight title look bad because that title is already kind of a struggle enough as it is type of thing. Like it's kind of starting now finally. I mean, to... Like, but if you have like a big challenger fight against him, yeah, face the media. I mean, or it's just. It's, they're in a tough spot at that point. I know. But I think that they want to do Roman Rock. They want to do that. They've wanted to do it for a while now. I know, yeah. And if, if you wanted to do it at, like, the Rumble, you could do the Rumble. I mean, and, um, I mean, yeah, Mania's probably the, the more realistic approach to do it, but it's like, you know, if you think about it, the Rumble might be a better effect because it's in Tampa, the Rock's, you know... A home state, pretty much, and all that type of stuff. And the Rumble... Yep. So, like, the Rumble doesn't take place in, like, a big venue or anything like that. It takes place in pretty big venues uh, recently. Yeah, the, so. the Tropicana Field, the, uh, the home of the uh, Tampa Bay Rays and the home of the Thunderdome. Yeah, so... Where the storyline started, ironically enough, too, so it would make all the sense in the yep. world. Like, plus, selfishly, I plan going to the Rumble, so, like, it would be nice if, uh, you know... Um, I mean, there might be another... I would do- at the Rumble, just for the fact that, like, if they don't want to have Roman do two nights, you save Cody for night two and then have someone else main event night one. Yeah. Or you can have Brock main event night one against someone else. I know. Austin Theory. Um, there is another caveat. You're not going to like this idea. That could be what CM Punk does when he comes back. I mean, it, it ties in because, you know... The Rock could I wouldn't be, mind, really. Um, you know, that could be CM Punk's first match back because, you know, that kept him from main event in WrestleMania um, all that time ago and all that type of stuff. He could get his win, and Punk could get his win back, so. Yeah, exactly. You could do that. That could main event night one. I think people tune in for that, honestly. And I hate to say it, if you put Punk in the main event slot at Mania, I don't think he'll have, he's not, no way he's going to, um, be a screw up backstage, hopefully, type of thing. You know, like he's gonna realize, like, yeah, I'm getting a chance to main event Mania here. I don't deserve this spot, type of thing. Probably, I mean, he wouldn't say he deserves this spot. He's to be humble. Yeah, um, but maybe I would humble him, humble him a little bit. Maybe he'd be like, okay, I'm actually get I get the main event Mania. I didn't get this before. Um, you know, I would say with that with with the punk situation is he seems to be a model employee. I mean, he want. I-, I can tell you for a fact he wants to go back to WWE. I-, I know that for a fact. Yeah. Because he wanted to go back at the Rumble this year. He wanted to be a surprise entry in the Rumble. He was trying to get out of his contract so he could go back into WWE and be in the Rumble. 
But now it's like, he also precariously said that he can't do any. He has, he's free for two months. Yeah. Because uh, he's gonna do he's gonna do the the UFC commentating gig that he's been doing, um, for the last like year or so, year plus. And conveniently enough, two months from now, Survivor Series is in Chicago. Yeah. I think that's when they bring him back. Yeah, I would say if he's not at Survivor Series, he's not coming back at all. Just because uh, that's like the only chance for him to come back. Uh, they could do. They could. I mean, at the same time, if he's not back, I would say if he's not back, if he's not, if they don't bring him back for Survivor Series in Chicago, I think the last thing for me would probably be the Rumble. Yeah. Because then he's clear. He's clear by then, so he'll be he'll be eligible for Survivor Series and the Rumble. I just think if they don't if they don't bring him in for a Survivor Series or the Rumble, it's not happening. Yeah. Um. And again, I think, you know, obviously that's a tight situation. They're going to have to figure out what they want to do with Punk backstage and all that type of stuff. We said this before, he can't do full-time. That's been that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, one for his body, because he, he he kept getting injured anytime they put the belt on, anytime AEW put the belt on him. Um, and then uh, I feel like, too, his morale might be better if he's not doing full-time type of thing, too. Like... I don't think he wants. Yeah, he might get happier punk. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I think he's got to be a heel, too, just because uh, I feel like AEW... You realize, by the way, that's the second time they missed the opportunity to turn, like, a big star they had heel. And then both those both those big stars they didn't turn heel are going to be ba- are gonna be right back in WWE, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. Like, but at the same time, though, would they, would they, like, rely on the fact that Cody got over in WWE and not turn him heel? That's true. By the way, if CM Punk... Can you imagine, by the way, if the same thing happens in WWE with Punk that happened with Cody, where he comes back, he gets uh, <laughs> tremendous... Of, I mean, it is going to happen that way in the beginning, obviously, because, you know, a lot of people haven't seen Punk since uh, he left WWE the first time. But, like, just imagine how bad AEW... Not just how bad AEW, but how bad the fan base is going to look when... Uh, CM Big Punk times. when CM Punk gets like great reactions every week and you know, all that. Because most Punk fans are gonna are starting to depart AEW now. Yeah. So. Um, all right, we went off a bit of a tangent, but yeah. <laughs> but so Rock comes out and there and he gets into like a promo battle with Austin Theory. Theory, first of all, the biggest fucking no no you can do in wrestling is don't fucking cut the Rock off. Don't fucking do that. You're going to get your ass kicked. Yep. He fucking should have seen that coming from a mile away because he got the rock off when he was doing his finally bit. And that was a fucking mistake because uh, the rock just eviscerated him. And uh, they said uh, him and McAfee were leading the You Are an Asshole chant, which was censored on television. Which sucks. Um, which I thought was, you know, the whole bit itself was fucking hilarious. Uh, rock was, rock again, that man fucking just clicks on all cylinders uh the whole time it was it was he was amazing in, in, in this in this promo mcafee just being a fan was awesome uh just leading the chant going back and forth uh it was awesome uh eventually they uh uh austin theory decides to he wants to hit the rock in the face <laughs> yes he does that was a bad decision by Austin Theory. Austin, you idiot. Because The Rock beat the shit out of him, hit him with the spine buster, and hit him with the people's elbow. And then after he hits him with the people's elbow, he instructs Pat McAfee to do so. Pat McAfee does the people's elbow with a little more pizzazz to it. And that's how it ends. They dap each other up, and then they go and do the arm thing on the uh, on the post The Rock does fucking crowd's going fucking delirious like they did for the whole entire fucking segment. Um, fucking awesome. Yeah. This whole segment was awesome. Um, talk about, like, Austin Theory for a second. I know I joke around, like, got his ass kicked, he deserved it, but as a, as a fan who grew up loving the WWE, talk about, like, what a fucking throw ride it's been for him. He gets fucking stunned by Steve Austin, Last year at WrestleMania, and he gets people's elbow by The Rock. 
That's people's fucking fantasy right there. Any fan, any fan would be would die to be in Fury's position in the last year. Not even just that. He beat Cena at Mania this year, and basically his whole gimmick was that he was like a Vince McMahon like chosen one like type of thing. Like that. Yeah. That's huge. Like um, exactly. But like he got to he beat Cena at Mania. He got stunned by Austin last year at Mania, and this and this year he gets people's elbow by The Rock. Like that's everyone's fantasy. Yeah. Is to be like in that position that he's in, and it's fucking awesome. Like I'm, I'm just so happy for him that he got to be in that position. Espe- um, especially to, uh, I mean, whatever happened, happened. He was probably gonna get fired because the black, not the black Wednesday. What was those things? The speaking out movement was taking place. He was like in the speaking out movement. Like he was almost probably, out, he was almost probably fired three years ago, type of thing. Like, uh, yeah, and that a lot. I mean. I don't want to talk about that too much, but like, yeah, a lot of that was just made up on it. Uh, like, a lot of the stuff that was that that was said about him wasn't true. There you go. I'm just saying, like, that's uh, crazy to think about, though, type of thing. Like, exactly. Yeah. That, that's just it was awesome. Yeah. This whole segment was great. Um, it just it it brings you back to being a kid again. By the way, the rock the rock looked fucking fantastic. He did. That dude did. That dude has not aged in fucking fifteen years. Like he he's fifty years old, you couldn't even tell. And I think we'll just say this: yeah. uh, wrestling fans, I gotta say, are probably benefited right now from the ho- uh, probably the only market right now really benefiting from the Hollywood strike because we've gotten John Cena yep. back uh, on a re- relatively regular basis, and we just got we might be getting the walk back now in some in like I said, like, like that's like as a as a fan and a kid who grew up watching the Rock, like it just like it, it hits home, and it's like I was literally stunned. When that when that music hit, my jaw hit the floor. Yeah, I was like, I got goosebumps. I was like, holy shit! Like, it's been so long since I've been, I've been like dying to see him back in a WWE ring again, whether it be in a promo segment, a match, or whatever. I've been dying so for so long to see him come back, and it's been so fucking long, and it's awesome. It's been so it was so awesome. It's the great. It's a great way to kick off the fucking show. It was fan. It was fantastic. And I'm not gonna rip too much on the fact he didn't do anything like bloodline related. Because one, I don't even think they expected the Rock was gonna be able to show up at all. So like, I I think they had to write this segment fairly last minute and all that type of stuff. And two, I don't know if it, I, I let's also kind of wait on that type of thing because they may not even be able to deliver on it because they have to like like with Cena right now they have to get around all the insurances and you know yeah. I didn't said the strike's not ending anytime soon, but if the strike ends before like Mania or anything like that, then they can't even do the ma- they can't even like do the match type of thing. I mean, I assume it depends. So if the strike happens ends before Mania, it depends on how because he might be committed to it. Yeah, because a lot of like when he the, the match he the second match he had against Cena when he tore his fucking adductors in his groin, um, he was dead set on having that match. Yep. So it's not like he and with with. With Dwayne, it's like this is this was his first love. If he's deeply invested in a storyline, he's not gonna go film a random movie project. Yeah. And say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. He's gonna it's WWE is his home and it's always gonna be his home. And he has so much love for the McMahon family and whatnot that I think he would fulfill his commitments to them first and then do the movie afterwards. I mean, I think people... I've, I've heard people say this before, too. It might be good for The Walk to get out of the acting business for a little bit, like you said, like, because, you know, the strike's going on, XFL didn't do as well, and then, you know, he had a couple of failed movie things. It might be good for his morale and all that type of stuff to do wrestling. Black Adam didn't do as well as they thought, and the XFL lost about $100 million. So, it's a, it's a good... It's, it's... He, and the, and the, um... The commercial that he did with Oprah Winfrey recently is not really, um, not really going over that well. So, it's good for him to kind of get some good PR after some missteps recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, we know what I, one promo belt I want. Uh, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, the uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That'd be so cool, yeah. That'd be so cool too, because he's a face now too. So how would that even work? Like the lock, I think we put him over. He wouldn't even like put him down type of thing. 
Oh, he would put him over 100%, put him over. And we still need that Grayson Waller <laughs> one, you know. Uh, Grayson Waller, apparently, according to him, was trying to find the lock, but the lock was avoiding him, like, backstage and all that type of stuff. That's where, that's according to Grayson Waller, anyways, so. Come on, Grayson, you right there, you little fucking <laughs> pussy. Get, get your ass over there and go talk, talk shit to his face and watch what happens, little bitch. He said he tried finding him, but he said he was he, the lock was kind of going out of his way to avoid him and all that type of stuff. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! He's a little coward. He probably hid in his locker room. <laughs> well, He's trying to hide from the rock because the rock would have beat his ass. Not even that. He was probably going. Play he was probably going out of his way to avoid the rock. He was probably like avo going to places the rock wasn't type of thing. It'd be funny if like the rock had like his location on on his phone or something like on Snapchat or whatever, and like Grayson Waller was like yeah. using that to try to avoid the rock. Like you see, like the thing on the map that like he the rock's getting close to him, and Grayson Waller's just like crap, and he's like looking at his phone trying to get away from the rock. <laughs> I love it. Oh, you know, he's just like he shows up like five minutes after the Rock leaves, like catering. <laughs> I was like, I knew the Rock wouldn't be here. What a coward! I'm trying to find him. Oh, that'd be awesome. I should say, I'll send you the video later of like the promo that he cuts because uh, it'd be it was pretty awesome. Uh, what other promo segment we need? And you're gonna love this. Him and Dom need to have a segment together. I know, I know you want that. I know you want that. Like. <laughs> I mean, Dom need to have a segment where Dom doesn't say a fucking word and he gets rock bottom through a table and then people's elbowed and then rock. Then they set up another table and he gets rock bottom to that table and he set up another table and he gets rock bottom to that table again. <laughs> they set up another table and he gets rock bottom to a third table and then people's elbowed again on the floor so it hurts even more on the on the concrete floor. <laughs> he said he, he's gonna kill him though. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he gets for being a piece of piece of shit, son. I feel like too the lock wouldn't even have to do it. It doesn't matter what you say to Dom when he talks because he won't even be able to get a word out anyway. Type of thing, like <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't and, because fuck Dom. That's why. There you go. Fuck him, fucking asshole. <laughs> uh, so next we had AJ Styles versus Finn Balor, and. I felt like this match, it just, every match they've had has been good to great, and this match just felt kind of off. It di it felt rushed, it didn't really... It probably was rushed, to be fair. It, it didn't have, like, the same kind of, the same type of, like, AJ Finn chemistry that they you'd normally have. Um, yeah, it's just sort of like, it was just, some, something felt super, super off about it. Um, I thought that was good overall, but yeah, I agree. It didn't feel like they had the, you know, it felt like they, uh, they were probably well rushed for time a little bit because they were probably supposed to have like an epic match type of thing, but then obviously because the lock was there, the segment went twenty minutes. Yeah, so hey, Finn Balor was it was it Mister Eight O'clock? He was actually Mister Eight Twenty Two. Yeah, because he couldn't uh, he couldn't do a se he couldn't do a segment right away. So, uh, and then, uh. Finn Balor, I ca capitalized on a Jimmy Uso interference to hit him with a crucifix pin and win. Yeah. Yeah, overall, uh, relatively fine stuff here. It, it's it's pretty obvious, like Steve said earlier, it seems like AJ Styles is going to be the next guy to challenge for the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship, so the trying to protect him as much I think he can, even if he has to take a defeat type of thing, which I think they're doing a pretty good job of. I'm kind of happy that can happen now, because it seems like either Heyman and Styles are going to put the differences aside if they still have them type of thing to do a program together, or they've patched things up type of thing backstage, so that's good. Yeah. They mentioned, so, uh, they mentioned also, too, that it seems like Luke Gallows has an injury. Um, he does. He, he's on, he, he has an undisclosed injury. They don't know what's going on. They didn't reveal exactly what the injury was, but it's legit. Yeah, so... He's legitimately hurt right now. And I don't know, um, and Carl Anderson wasn't there just because he wasn't there, so... Yeah, no, it's... Yeah, that's... It seemed kind of odd at first not to see him with them, and then finding out that Gallows was hurt. It, and But it, Anderson not being there was kind of odd, too, but... Yeah. It kind of made sense for it, for it to be, like, uh, the way it was, because they... Because they've, um... Yeah, that's it made sense for the end. Yeah, it did. Um, so they come back from pressure break, and, and Pat and, and Rock are, are recapping the opening segment. They kind of go back and forth about like you like 
but calling Austin Theory an asshole, which, which is really funny. And then uh, Cena, and then, then Cena rolls up to the, to them, and it looks like uh, a very tense kind of sta- uh, face off between them, uh, between Rock and Cena, as you all know. Cena replaced Rock in the Fast and the Furious movies uh, because of uh, Rock's uh, differences with Vin Diesel. Apparently, they patched those things up, and he's going to be in the mo- in the next Fast and the Furious movie. I mean, don't but, uh, don't forget too. Uh, they also had like a history, like a three year history with each other too, type of thing, like feud. Oh yeah, then that the feud. You can put, kind then, of forgetting uh, to mention that. <laughs> like you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. They feuded for a while, legitimately, because they didn't like each other. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so they, but Rock just, uh, John just basically says, you know, welcome home, and they, and they handshake and they hug. And everything looks fine between them. They're smiling and everything, which was awesome to see. Um, even though they had patched things up a long time ago. But uh, those were really awesome to see. There's, Two of the best of the generation. There's what Kind of just being in the same r- r- room again together. There is a, one other match they could do while there's strikes going on. Tag match, Roman and Solo versus Walk and Cena. I'd like to see that. Um, if they. Oh, you could do that. You could do that. Oh, no, then uh, it's another pay-per-view where Roman doesn't defend his belt, though. So it's like, you know, if he's wrestling, I want him defending his championship type of thing. Not Like, I was cool with the tag matches, but I feel like we're starting to do too many of those tag tag matches now type of thing. Like, I feel like uh, the next three times, the next few times Roman wrestles, he should be defending his belt type of thing. It's, I think it's uh, we're getting to, to be too much into that type of thing where he's not defending his title type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so next we have J- uh, Jimmy Uso's with Paul Heyman backstage with Paul Heyman lurking backstage they have F- uh, Finn Balor kind of just rolled up and be- um, offered him a spot in the Judgment Day I guess it was really just odd um, after they had already offered J- uh, Jay a spot on the, on, the, on the Judgment Day and he didn't say no to that but uh, he basically says there's no leaders in Judgment Day, and you know that, and and that means no Roman. But I mean, it was an interesting enough segment, um, and they called him Jim Uso, which I thought was fucking really weird and really funny. Yeah, he's just Jim. I'm Jim Uso. Sounds like a. <laughs> it's really weird. But overall, I liked this. You know, um, it would be interesting if they did have Jimmy Uso join Judgment Day type of thing. It'd be weird, though, because they're trying to make it seem like he'd be able to be with his brother again. Like, wait, does that all that has to happen is to, for him to join, for them to have a cross pass? Because they're supposed to be a brand split. I like how they try to be like, yeah, Judgment Day can just be on SmackDown now because of the tag chance. It's like, well, what, what's the Miz doing on SmackDown then? He's a, he's a WOG guy, so it's like... It, because there is no brand split anymore. They're trying to, they, they, they try to keep it going type of thing, but then it's just like, uh, what do you do? Mm. You're mentioning... You mentioned, oh, the Judgment Day can be on SmackDown. Why, why is Dom on SmackDown? He's not even the tag champ. Like, they just can do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. Because they're WWE. I mean, I can't believe I, I can't believe Dom not sticking to the brand split. He, he, he's, 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 he's very delinqu- He's a, he's a delinquent type of thing. It's a piece of shit. Yeah. So, and anyhow, yeah. I, I, overall, I like this for what it was. Uh, so next we have uh, LWOs in the ring and. Uh, Santos uh, asks Ray for a uh, for a U.S. Championship match, and it, it kind of makes it seem like there were kind of teasing tension between them. And it turns out, all for naught, they kind of go back and forth with like uh, staring each other down almost. And uh, but yeah, they're gonna have a U.S. Championship match, and. If this is going to cause a rift in the LWO, I'm going to be pissed. Uh, because that would just be fucking stupid. And it's just like, it's just, it just feels like so. The match needed to happen. Because Ray's U.S. champion, and he's only U.S. champion because Santos gave his blessing. So, in return, Ray should give Santos a title shot. I honestly feel that that's the best way to go about it. Um, but it just... I, I, I don't 
I don't need the tension shit. I could do I could do without it. Yeah, overall, I thought this was relatively good. I did like he at least did say, like, hey, I gave you my blessing. He's not asking for the match because he got screwed over. He's asking for it because that's, like, a dream he always wanted type of thing. It was weird the way I live in. Like, he was just like, like, wait, do you want to challenge for my championship? And then, yeah, he was just like, yeah, you can have the title match type of thing. So, uh, that was weird. Because then, like, where he's going to be the face out of it, he shouldn't seem hesitant to want to defend his title type of thing because... If Santos turns, everyone's is everyone just gonna take Santos' side type of thing? Like, is everyone just gonna be like, yeah? But I feel like, uh, you know, I guess you could turn while Mendoza and while Ken Wild, but I don't really think you could turn Zelina. I think Zelina's too old with that baby face to go back heel again. Yeah. So it's just weird that they fractured already. It's it's just weird. Yeah. They, um, they did this weird thing too. They posted online talking about. Um, you know, Selena Vega having, like, a match, like, before the 9-11 and all that type of stuff. And it was last week doing, a, like, a dark match on, like, SmackDown and all that type of stuff. And they tried to hype it up, like, that she had, like, this big match and all that type of stuff. And she went away on these colors. But it's like, yeah, I get it happened before 9-11, but I don't think WWE booked, booked the match thinking 9-11 was about, well, 9-11 anniversary anyways was about to happen. I gotta be careful what I was about to say there. But, um... But it was just a dark match. I think that it just, ha it just happened to be booked on that episode of SmackDown type of thing. I don't think it had anything to yeah. do with Nyla. I'm also just sick of them like if they if they really wanted to do something, they could have had her had a match compete on Raw. Yeah, not like because they didn't even. If they're really hyping up a match, it should have been. Yeah, she should have had a match on Raw on the 9/11 anniversary yeah. as a tribute to her father. Yeah, because it was all weird because like they had the dark match on SmackDown, but they didn't air the interview talking about the match until after like this week type of then it's like wait but this happened last this happened last week like before the like it, it, this was taped before that why not just air this last week why didn't they just put it online last week like it didn't make any sense like yeah um i'm also just thick of them it seems like too uh it, it, they were trying to give like selena vega like i assume they want to talk about it but they've talked about this story before and again it's given selena vega like Sympathy, she doesn't need... Like, she's already over. You don't need to talk about this. Yeah. Like, um... We don't. It's, uh, it's already been talked about the death already, but at the same time, it's it's definitely a, yeah. a big part in her life. So it's like, I can kind of see why they would... why they want to keep talking about it. But they don't need to. Yeah, I mean, they don't need to, but to gain her sympathy, but like... Yeah. Yeah, it just seems very. And again, uh, if you weren't going to air it last week, then why air it? Then why did you show it at all, type of thing? Like, exactly, yeah. Um. So, is that? So then, Bobby Lashley and Street Profits come out, and the they start talking shit to uh, the LWO, and then Joaquin Wild and um, Cruz del Toro both basically go. Hey, if you wanna, uh, we'll f hey, if you wanna have a tag match, we'll fight you right now. I know she was struggling. That was uh, uh, yeah. I know she was struggling with Wal Mendoza's name right there. You couldn't think of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reverting you back. Or no, slowly. Fucking something happened, and the BC just had a massive play. All right, you can <laughs> like you can believe. <laughs> I was gonna just watch it in a forty yard carry. You can uh, believe what you want to believe, but I saw some struggling right there. So, see. I call him Cruz Del Toro, not the stupid name that you decided to call them. Um, but yeah, I mean, this match was a nothing match. Um, Street Profits win, and afterwards they get angry and attack uh, Joaquin Wilde and Cruz Del Toro, and then they Ray and Santos get in the ring, kind of shove them off, like, what are you doing? And then they turn their backs on them, stupid and baby faces. And then they get attacked from behind, and yeah, that's basically how it ends. Yeah, um, relatively fine stuff. Nothing really wrong here. I thought the match with you know um, LWO and the Street Profits was fairly short. I definitely think this match was cut for time because of the walk segment. So I can't really fault it too much. I think everything was cut for time because of the walk. But segment. this especially because this lasted like no time, but like this lasted like you know. Um, yeah, they got they got like nothing. Yeah, but. Um, you know, it is what it is. Um, I like what they're doing with the Street Puppets and Bobby Lashley. I do, though, they add Bianca Belair to this faction. I know she says that, uh, you know, she wouldn't want to go heel, by the by the way, and stuff. But 
I think this is a way to kind of do it because the street profits aren't all that different. Um, they're just more of sa they they just fight with more viciousness and stuff. I think Bianca could just keep the same gimmick and stuff and just yeah. you know. This is a way for her, them to be healed. Even though I don't know what they're supposed to be. I think they're more tweeners. They had a face-off last week with uh, Judgment Day. So, like, I think uh, they're more in the tweener world. Um, they lie more on the heel thin because, like, they do more heel tactics. But they're definitely, like, tweeners uh, type of thing. Um, so, this does lead to uh, Ray and Santos online challenging, um, you know... Street Profits to a tag match. I guess, I'm going to guess that mess, that segment was meant to air on TV, but they didn't ran out of time, so they had to just post it online on YouTube type of thing. Because uh, Yeah, I think that's how that, I think that's true. Yeah, because you could definitely tell that was like one of those segments, because it wasn't like, they went like to like the actual interview like set they had backstage, so I think that segment was meant to air on TV, but obviously because uh, of the Rock segment it went on. I just imagine, by the way, like, is the whole show at one point just going to have to be Rock and Roman if they do their feud like the thing? Because uh, a lot of stuff's going to get cut from SmackDown when they, once they start having a segment together. Like, yeah, I wonder if they're going to carry that over to Raw. Like, they may have to. Like, They could. Well, the SmackDown might have, to, might have to be three hours for at least a few weeks. Like, um, yeah, I wonder how they're going to do that. But anyhow, yeah, continue with the breakdown of SmackDown. So, um... They come back from uh, commercial break, uh, and they're basically hyping up the Rumble being in Tampa. We get a video package of their previous encounters, The Miz and L.A. Knight, and we cut to that match, and it's L.A. Knight versus The Miz. It's a very good, again, another really good match, back-and-forth match. Um, and at, near the end, uh, Miz goes for, hits a, like a nasty code breaker on, on the... On the uh, from the ropes, Ellen kicks out, and then uh, he hits him with the uh, BFT for the win. Uh, really good match. Um, afterwards, he cut a promo, and he, you know his usual promo and whatnot that he would cut, and it was just really fucking good. Yeah, absolutely awesome. Basically, he just challenged for all the belts. Um, I mean. They might have plans for LA Knight because uh, Heyman and Solo were watching specifically this match, so that might be maybe not the next challenger, but that might be you know a future challenger right there for Roman Reigns, which uh, I don't mind. I don't know if I really want it though, just because if LA Knight's not winning, I feel like it's gonna hurt his momentum a little bit if he loses that match. Um, it might help him out in the long run, obviously, because you know if you're feuding with the Tribal Chief, typically. Uh, it's not a bad thing, but, like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to see that match. I felt like Knight's not going to win, so... Um, we'll see. But uh, I do want to see, though, just to see L.A. Knight and Heyman have a promo segment together type of thing. And that might be, like, one of the first people, by the way, that's going to be able to out-talk Tribal Chief Roman Reigns on the mic. Like, really good, so... Uh, that could be good stuff. Um, but... Yeah, I liked this match overall. I don't think this match suffered. I think this match went the exact length it was going to go because it went through a break and everything like that. So, overall, I thought this yeah. was relatively good stuff. I thought it was good. Really good. Just super over again. Um, so, Paul Heyman's backstage in, in, with with um, Solo. And they're kind of talking about Jimmy Uso, how he's making... Side deals with the Judgment Day, pick and fights with Cena, uh, and he's kind of getting, he's kind of dipping his toes into things, and that they're not really liking that. And on top of it, too, he's not fully in the bloodline, but he's acting like it. And the only way um, that anything could come is from the Tribal Chief. So, if he's in, it's because of Roman. It's not, he can't be in himself. It's not how that works. It's going to be accepted by Roman. Uh, but yeah, I thought this segment, like, was good. And it just, like, kind of uh, goes over just a bunch of side things that Jimmy Uso is doing. Fucking getting to stick his nose into other people's business. Yeah, overall, I thought this was, like, relatively good. Um... They are trying to make sense of the bloodlines up as much as they can. I feel like it's still kind of not, like, clicking for me type of thing because uh, they did that segment a few weeks ago where, like, Solo said, you're not out until we say you're out. 
I feel like it's. I feel like this is more of them trying to come back to that they did that type of thing. It still doesn't really make sense, obviously, that Jimmy's trying to get back into the bloodline when he's the reason Jay's even on Raw to begin with and everything like that. Like, he started, like we said at SummerSlam, he started all of this, and now it's like, you know, I think we're starting to kind of see, like, a bit... I don't think the bloodline angle is necessarily dropped the shock or anything like that, but this is kind of like the start to that type of thing. Like, I don't... Um, I don't think we're quite there with Jump the Shot, but this is like the first time where like the bloodline angle is kind of starting not to make sense a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like if they had like a they had a good style when it looked like Jimmy wasn't um, was doing this off his own volition, um, and we'll talk about it later. But other back. Yeah. Now if and we'll talk about it later, but I don't think uh, let's just say Jimmy hasn't like looked the strongest since he's turned type of thing. I think he's been laid out every week, so. Um, oh yeah, so he's picking fights with Cena. He keeps getting fucking attitude adjusted. <laughs> and then he lost last week, and then he got super kicked by Jay the week before. So I know it's early days, but like I know you're, you're gonna hate to say this, but when Dom uh, ter- first turned, I don't think he lost a match until Wrestle until uh, WrestleMania. So um, I- he deserved to lose all of his matches. <laughs> I noticed you're not giving shade to Jimmy for turning on his cousin and all that type of stuff. Uh, why is Jimmy getting, like, a pass here and, like, Dom doesn't get a pass? Did he turn on his Hall of Fame father? He turned on his brother, though, his twin brother. That's not his Hall of, that's not his Hall of Fame father. Well, he wasn't even a Hall of Famer, though, at the time when he turned on him. So what, what do you have to say about that? Hall of Famer. Uh, Hall of Famer. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, but so I'm just going to combine these next two because I am. And I was next because it's, yeah. Um, Adam Pierce is backstage and he basically meets up with Pretty Deadly. And um, basically, they said that Adam Pierce is saying that his uh, Elton Prince's shoulder is, uh, is, is progressing and he's getting better. Um, and it's a, it's going to be a, a little while longer before he can really get back into a proper training regimen. Um, and then Bailey and Dakota Kai were talking about EOS guy's absence, and then they basically brought up Oscar and whatnot, and asked her if she's ready for her. I thought these segments were fine. Um, yeah, I thought they, I thought they, I mean. I like how they brought up the fact that Io was was there, which just seemed very odd because I felt like she would be there. But yeah, yeah, relatively good stuff here. You know, it built up very nice things. It's just still weird that they're making pretty deadly the heels when Ridge Hollins is the one that injured them. Like it's weird that that's they're the heels out of it. Like I guess because they're being dicks about it, but it's like Ridge Holland hurt them, um, type of thing. Like yeah, he didn't mean to do it, but it's like you know. It's not like, too, he's apologizing about it or anything like that. He's even saying, you get in the rim with me, you're going to get hurt type of thing. So I was like, oh, what are you doing here type of thing? So, you know, uh, it's also weird that the, I, I guess it's good they're staying on TV, but it's also weird because they can't do anything. They can't really do anything. Um, so, you know, I would at least like it if they had, like, um, Kit Wilson have at least a match with, like, a member of the Brawler Boots at least. That way, you know, it keep, there's a reason for them to be on TV and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So, it's also weird because they can't do anything about this feud for, like you said, a few months type of thing. So, yeah. Uh, then we have so, the main event match. Yeah, the main event match. Not the main event second. The main event match uh, is Asuka versus Bailey. Um, this is a pretty good match, and uh, about halfway through the match, uh, but near the ending of the match, um, I think Asuka gets thrown into the almost gets thrown gets thrown near the barricade and then Shotzi pops up and scares the crap out of Bailey um scares her back into the ring and whatnot and yeah and Asuka that basically causes Asuka to win via a backslide and I felt like this the match was fine it, it could have been a little bit better I uh, would have liked to see an Os- Oscar win definitively, um, but yeah, it was fine for what it, for what it was. Yeah, and I could have done without the Shotzi like interference type of thing. I don't really, th- yeah, I don't I get why they're continuing this feud. Shotzi's pretty much gotten her revenge on Bailey. She's beat her twice now, so it's like I don't know why they're continuing this feud. 
Yeah, exactly. I just very. I odd. feel like too. I just know nothing's gonna come from this once this feud's over. It's pretty much obvious that I think Shotzi would just go. Honestly, what let's talk about it. She might be future endeavored. Honestly, um, after this feud's over. Yeah, honestly, because she's done nothing. Yeah, she's literally done nothing, and she's. I don't get why. She hasn't been yet. Yeah. Especially too with her, she's a, especially too with her performances in the big sta- when it comes to the big stages type of thing, like at the Money in the Bank last year and uh, Survivor Series last year. So it's like you know, it's kind of like eh, you know. I don't want to see anyone lose exactly. their job type of thing, but if like if Shotzi ended up like departing from the company type of thing, um, I don't think the company would hurt from it type of thing. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be hurt by it. Yeah. She'd probably just go to, like, uh-huh. AEW and, like, do a bunch of extreme stuff there and all that type of stuff and be injured every chance she gets. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I could see that happening. Um, but so they... So they come back from commercial break, and it's the, and it's the main event segment of the show. Last, last thing they go on, it's the Grayson Waller effect. And his guest is John fucking Cena. And... Waller starts just talking fucking mad shit. And, you know, they go back and forth, and Cena eventually takes his fucking shirt off and throws it in the crowd. Um, and then Jimmy, and then Jimmy Uso comes out. And they get each other's faces. They stop rolling back and forth. And then Solo comes out to aid his, his, uh, his older brother. And they have him in the corner. They're beating the crap out of him. AJ makes the save, um, hits the five knuckle shuffle uh, uh, on Jimmy Uso, and then as he was about to hit him with the attitude adjustment, they hit him. Uh, Solo comes in and then saves him. And that was it. That's how the show faded to black. Uh, and I thought, I mean, I I thought the segment was really good. Um, I liked it. It's showcased scene in a big way. It showcased Chris and Wall in a big way. And then Jimmy Uso and got involved and whatnot, along with Solo. And AJ made the save. I thought that was really cool. I liked it. Yeah, I wonder if they're doing a tag match, maybe with Cena and Styles versus Jimmy and Solo. Um, maybe at Fastlane, that's the big match they do at Fastlane, just because, uh, you know, um, it makes sense, I would think. Um, but, we, we, but, but we'll see on that. Uh, overall, this was all relatively good. I love that Cena couldn't even get a word out. I thought that was hilarious. Uh, every time he tried to speak, he either got cut off by Grayson Waller or someone coming out or something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, just really not a fan of Jimmy Uso's heel turn at the moment. He's looked like a complete bitch ever since he's, uh, turned heel. I don't think he stood tall one week where, uh, well, let me just, he has stood tall, but I don't think there's been a week where he hasn't looked like a fool and all that type of stuff. And that's not good if the big if the if everyone's reporting that the big main event match at WrestleMania is gonna be Jimmy Uso versus Jay Uso. It's not good if one of your competitors isn't looking all that strong going into that and all that type of stuff. Because Jay's Oh yeah. I know Jay lost this week, but he's at least looked strong in uh the two weeks he's been he's looked more strong the two weeks that he's shown up versus the four weeks that Jimmy's been there. So it's like I don't understand uh what we're doing the type of thing. Like um, and I think I did call this that Jimmy was going to struggle on SmackDown more than Jay would on Raw because I think Jay could stand out on his own on Raw because he's got, you know, his own storylines going on. I mean, he's the main focus on Raw right now, pretty much. So, um, and Jimmy's just kind of like, I wouldn't even call him like a B player. He's like a, like the C level type of player on all that type of stuff. So, yeah, that was SmackDown. I thought SmackDown was a relatively, uh, you know. Really good show. I'm going to give it a B plus just for the walk showing up. I thought that was awesome. And then obviously I liked uh, the stuff, the Grayson Waller effect. And I still thought we had some matches that were still relatively good enough, obviously. Um, so, yeah, overall I liked uh, SmackDown. What did you think of SmackDown? Um, I give it a B plus um, for the beginning and the end. The Rock coming back was amazing. And the scene on the Grayson Waller effect was great. There you go. We're going to cover some news things now because we got some pretty big uh, news things. So we did have the bump this week. I will cover that real quick because that does have to news- do with some news things. That took place on September 13th, 2023. The hosts of that were Megan Morant, Ryan Popola, Matt Camp. Um, 
and that's it. Um, and then uh, they did some funny introductions since uh, Samantha Irvine and Ricochet were both going to be on the show. They had Samantha Irvine introduce all of them. And she hyped it up like she was going to introduce Ryan Popola, but instead she interviewed like the tech hand guy who looked like he didn't want to be on camera, so I thought that was pretty funny. Um, they interviewed... They did a segment like that was taped last week where Kayla Braxton interviewed Matthew McConaughey because he... Uh, is a big wrestling fan and all that type of stuff. There was really no tie-in why he was there, though, other than he's a celebrity that likes wrestling, like, just promoted his book, and then they did, like, a surprise cameo with, uh, Hackshaw Jim Duggan. It was really odd, obviously, just because of what's happened with Hackshaw Jim Duggan recently. Like, I feel like, uh, they should have just aired it last week. I mean, yeah, they couldn't have called that Hackshaw Jim Duggan was going to have to have a emergency surgery, but it was also really odd because then they had to come back, and they basically had to, like, tell us, like, yeah, that was filmed before... Hackshaw went in for a surgery and all that type of stuff. It's like, eh, did we really need to see that then? Um, I could have done without this. Matthew McConaughey, you know, obviously was a big thing that they got. They didn't advertise it at all that he was even really going to be there. So it's like, what was the point of even putting a volume if you weren't going to advertise it? So that was just really odd. Um, it just came to kind of like a waste. You know, obviously he talked about how he's a big wrestling fan. and he's a, He didn't say anything new about that. He's a, He says, yeah, I was a big fan. And he's, like, one of those people that, like, only watch it, like, back in the day type of thing. Like, he, he said he did watch it now, but I think he only watches it now because his son watches it now. So it's like, yeah, he doesn't really know what, he does not know what's going on type of thing. And I like how they hyped up, like, Kayla Braxton's last episode of The Bump was going to be that. She's been in, like, five episodes since then. Like, okay. So I, well, that, that was a waste. Um, then they uh, interviewed uh, Samantha Irvine and uh, Ricochet. They talked about their relationship. Ricochet talked about his match with SummerSlam at SummerSlam and how big that was. And then um, Samantha Irvine just talked about, like, you know, how she went and out to people and all that type of stuff. This was good, but it's just nothing new we haven't heard before because Samantha Irvine's been doing a lot of interviews and stuff recently, so you can just go watch those for that. Um, and then they had Seth Rollins get interviewed. This was a big deal because obviously he was on the first episode of The Bump and they talked about how he's changed as a person and a character since then. He talked about Becky being the NXT Women's Champion. He talked about like his back injury and all that type of stuff. He They talked some football, so I skipped right over that. Um, him and Ricochet were just talking trash for no reason, so... There you go. I, I skipped that part, though, because it was football talk. It was just typical, I'm going to talk trash about football. I don't even think they were supporting the teams that, like, they were supporting. I don't know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Seth talked about how he wants to make the World Heavyweight Championship the most prestigious title. So, this was, like, a relatively good episode of, of The Bump. I would give it, like, a B. I feel like you could have just cut out the Matthew McConaughey interview and just... I don't know why they didn't just show that last week. That was really weird. Um... But yeah, we do have some news. Obviously, the WWE and uh, UFC merger took place this week. It's now called, what is it, TKO type of thing? That's the name of the yeah. merger. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, they did a big event for it and everything like that. Kind of interesting, the big people they brought in for it was, uh, like, as soon as the superstars, was Montez Ford and uh, Bianca Belair. I thought that was kind of interesting, considering the fact, you know, you would thought you would have thought it would have been like, you know, at least Cody Rhodes, like, you know, and all that type of stuff. Roman Reigns, at least. Maybe not Roman Reigns, but you would have thought Cody would have been, like, a big factor, like, when it got, like, merged and all that type of stuff. But, uh, that's not what happened. They talked about the merger. Uh, there's been reports recently that they're saying they're going to do, like, big special events. So, basically, the UFC pay-per-views and the WWE pay-per-views will line up. I think they're saying that the UFC ones will be Saturdays and the... WWE ones will be Sundays. I hope it's reversed selfishly just because I've enjoyed the Saturday pay-per-views. Um, but, you know, I assume the UFC fans are probably saying the opposite. They would put... Well, actually, no. The UFC fans aren't saying the opposite because they get the Saturday shows. We have, we're the ones that have to suffer and watch the Sunday ones and get up and work in the next day and all that type of stuff. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, unfortunately, I mean, we've known this. This is going to be happening for a while. Friday, everybody worked remotely because uh, they're basically going to go over who they're gonna, uh, making cuts and uh, all that type of stuff. Um, they're going to be cutting, you know, people that, you know, they don't really feel the need because they have, they have people that can just do their roles anyways. Um, and then 
Uh, there's talks they're going to cut people from, like, Raw and SmackDown and NXT and all that type of stuff. Um, and, I mean, it sucks. It sucks that people have to kind of lose their jobs coming out of this, especially because it doesn't really need to happen type of thing because they're making all this money now and all that type of stuff. But It's it, just not... It's not money. It's... UFC and WWE have very similar management groups. Like, front office people. Yeah. So you can't have three people for one job. Or two people for one job, but you can't... You, you just can't. Yeah. I don't so think, someone's going to lose their job. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary for the wrestlers to lose their job. I don't know why they have to suffer because of the merger type of thing. Um, I really hope it's just kind of people that, the, that you know... I shouldn't say they're not really doing anything with because then Johnny Gargano is going to suffer for it because uh, he'll he'll be fired. But I should say people that, like, will win. But, like, you know, if they do get fired, it doesn't hurt the company too much and not a lot of people will get mad about it. I don't think we'll get ha- we're not going to be happy about it because people have to lose their jobs. But, you know, um, I just hope, you know, it's not all most of the talent that Triple H just brought back and all that type of stuff because, you know, it would be a waste to them and all that type of stuff. Um I don't know how Triple H honestly feels about this merger happening, obviously, because uh, this is very much a Vince thing. Um, you know, because Triple H, I hate to say it, had the company going in a really good direction under his own thing and all that type of stuff. And now it seems like even when Vince does retire now, he can't. he's still got to like go through all this rigmarole just so that way he like, can get the company running the way he wants to run it type of thing. So it's like, uh, Vince really left his legacy. but like he, he really wanted to leave his mark before he retired now, didn't he, type of thing. Like, I don't know. But, um, I still have them in the belief that Vince wanted to sell the company so he could weave his way back into the freaking, back into power, pretty much, just because, what a, I just say this, because he never wanted to sell the company before he was out of power, and now all of a sudden he wants to sell the company, it's just, I think it's just really odd. How, how do you feel about this merger and all this type of stuff and everything like that? It's whatever. Yeah. It's happened, I can't, I can't drag my feet on it, it yeah. happened. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I kind of hope nothing changes, like, on-screen-wise, everything like that. Everything could just kind of stay the nothing's same. Nothing's going to happen on-screen. Yeah. That's the one thing that they said. It's never, it, that nothing's changing that way. Yeah. Triple H is still in power. Triple H, Triple H goes to Nick, Con, to Nick Con, reports to Nick Con. He has a report to Vince. He reports to Nick Con. So, I, I don't... I assume nothing not, like... Uh, it's just going to be like them. They're still going to run the company the way they would have, probably, even if they weren't owned by somebody. Uh, they'll probably be like small changes. I imagine like if they sign somebody, they'll still be able to sign them, type of thing, all that type of stuff. So, oh yeah, so nothing to change. They, once these budget, once these cuts happen and everything, they're going to go right back into into buy mode again. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we'll see. It could. I, I. I. think it'd be kind of cool though if these cuts do happen, and within a year's time, anyways, Triple H just rehires them all. That'd be awesome. Like they're just like, yeah, we just cut all these people, and then all of a sudden, Triple H just rehires them within like a year or two, type of thing. Um, he could do that. Yeah, but um, you know, um, I think it'd be. I think it's gonna be whatever. You know, uh, I hear too. It's not like they're gonna get fired. I think. Did I hear too? They're gonna get at least some money out of it, type of thing. Like. Um, doing the firing type of thing, so it's not like they're fired and they're not going to have a place to work and all that type of stuff, so... Yeah, it's like a... Like a yeah. Yeah, so it, it'll be, uh, like a decent thing. Um, so yeah, this merger, we're going to see what happens with it, you know, hopefully it's, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully it's a good thing. Uh, other news, um, WWE may not be on Fox anymore, obviously the contract on Fox is up pretty soon. Uh, there's reports that it's going to go to CBS or Prime Video or Disney Plus. Um, I know it's one you want because, uh, you know, uh, you want you want Disney in the WWE market somehow. You just want that to happen. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I, we'll see what happens with that. You know, um, it would be interesting to see what happens to SmackDown if it has to go to a streaming service type of thing because that would be kind of cool. Um, I wonder how... The, the commercials would work and everything like that. Um, I wonder if they would go to three hours if they go to a streaming service, because obviously they don't have to go by the network and all that type of stuff. Um, they could go to CBS, that'd be okay, but, you know, uh, I think they, I think that, I would, I would be more intrigued to see what would happen if they went to Disney Plus or, you know, 
a primetime video type of thing. Because I feel like if it just goes to CBS, you know, it's really not that interesting. I think it, they just kind of, it's just kind of what it is now. Um, it probably sucks for them to lose Fox type of thing. Because that was like why they were getting so many views. Because Fox is on so many TV stations and all that type of stuff. But, uh, you know, they want to move away from wrestling, I guess. And I guess this is the way of doing that. I don't get why. It's like, you know, uh... SmackDown does really well on Fox. You would think you'd want to throw money at it. It's not like they have it hasn't brought Fox any value, but it's just the way they're going to do that. And you know, I don't think WWE really needs Fox because I think they're just going to keep plugging away without Fo- with or without Fox. I think Fox needs them more than WWE probably does. But how do you feel about the potential of this of this happening and all that type of stuff? Um, Fox doesn't want to pay three hundred million. Yeah, WWE's trying to get every penny. But uh, uh, they can't out of Fox to get a new contract. They don't want to. They don't. They don't want them anymore. And they, I don't know. I think their best bet probably be moving to Disney because they be they moved to ABC. And I don't know. I think they're moving to a streaming service would honestly kill them. It would kill SmackDown entirely. Well, we're ready to go right to WAF. By the way, let's just talk about that. Like because it's like what like. Not everyone has Amazon Prime. Yeah. They go to Amazon. I don't know what Jeff Bezos owns in terms of TV channels. Like, I don't know what, like, he owns. I don't know what channel he be, they, they put them on. But, yeah, it just seems like, I don't know. Selfishly, I want Disney because I would love to see a SmackDown-themed uh, or a WWE-themed restaurant. In, in Disney, that would be fucking sick. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, that's basically kind of what it is. Do you think Fox needs them more than uh, WWE does, or do you think WWE needs Fox more than uh, Fox? Does? It's tough to tell, but I think they need WWE more because their programming sucks. <laughs> it's just, it's just bad. It's bad TV shows with laugh tracks on them. There you go. So, I, I, I mean, it, they were. They were getting huge ratings, and I think if you take that away, it's just not gonna. It's just gonna go back to being the shady fox again. Yeah. Um. And yeah, another big thing: a big AEW star might be coming to WWE. Uh, if there was a hiring freeze, they're breaking it. Um, Jay Cargill uh is looking like she's gonna be WWE bound. I haven't seen the match yet, but she had a last match on Rampage. It looks like last night. Which makes more sense about why they did the, they rushed to get a rematch out of the way on Rampage because I was like, wait, why the hell are they doing? Why is AEW doing the match on Rampage? You think you'd want to do that stuff on like Collision and all that type of stuff? But yeah, that's because she might not be there much longer. It looked like it's looking like she's gonna sign with uh, WWE. Um, I think this is a great thing, just because uh, you know she has some relatively star power type of thing. Um, and I think she's going to flourish much better under the WWE system than the AEW system. I just don't really think AEW really understood uh, the kind of t- talent that she did have type of thing. And I feel like she was kind of set up for failure in AEW. Because obviously, she can't really do the AEW style type matches and all that type of stuff. Um, I think she's going to flourish much better in WWE because she can, you know, as you've seen with Roman Reigns, she doesn't even have to wrestle every week and all that type of stuff. She can honestly, you know, and, you know, she can train at the Performance Center and everything like that. So, like, I think uh, she's going to flourish much better in WWE. So, how do you feel about Jay Cargill going to uh, WWE? But, um, uh, I, I love it. I think this is the best option for her because um, Tony doesn't really have a fucking clue what to do with her. He didn't know what to do with her from the beginning. That entire thing about black workers and shit came out with Leo Rush and, um, who was it that got released? Big Swole. Uh, Big Swole. Um, all that shit happened and then it seemed like they just kind of put the belt on Jade because she was black. It just felt like that. And she just... She never really got particularly better in terms of, like, her in rank. I mean, she got... From where she was at the beginning until the time that she left, she obviously got, like, better in the ring. Um, 
And apparently this Rampage match is the best she's ever had. Okay. Uh, I hope that this is, like, the momentum that can be carried on to her. Because she could benefit from being on in WWE, being in sort of, like, Nia Jax, Rhea Ripley, to sort of roll. And I think it could benefit her in the long run, because I think she she could be a huge asset for, for WWE. And I think that that's the best sort of spot for her. Because I think she'll thrive in WWE. Yep. She absolutely, absolutely will thrive. Um, it's looking like she's going to be the next big sign-in from, you know, uh, that for the next big jump from AEW to uh, WWE, uh, which is going to be pretty cool. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting. I think she's going right to the main roster too, just because, you know, she has that TV experience. Uh, but I think she'll still work at the performance center and all that type of stuff, which will be great for her. And there's much, I, I mean, there's also, I think, better talent that she can work with, uh, in WWE than in AEW that have been in the business and have been on TV and everything for like years type of thing. So it's going to help her out in the long run and all that type of stuff. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what she does in WWE, uh, whether that's on SmackDown or Raw. She could be the, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't immediately push her just because, you know, obviously she's still, uh, she probably wouldn't be ready for a spot like that, but they should slowly uh, get her ready for like a big moment, maybe at, like WrestleMania or something. If she, that depends obviously too on when she comes in. If she comes in like at the Rumble time, it's like, eh, do you want to do that at WrestleMania? All depends type of thing. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we haven't broken this news yet. It's been out for a few weeks now, but I think we pretty much have broken the news. Brian Pillman Jr. also signed with uh, WWE. How long has he been signed now? Like a few weeks? Um, yeah, he's been signed for a few weeks now. So uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy about that. I think, uh, you know, he's going to do great in NXT, I think. Uh, it's looking like he's going to be on NXT, which... Uh, you know, I think we have concerns about it, obviously, because it's Shawn Michaels' book in NXT, but I think this is one name Shawn Michaels, for some reason, will not screw up just because of how much he knew Brian Pillman and all that type of stuff, and how close, like, you know, he was with him, and how close Stone Cold Steve Austin was with him, and I, let's be real, I feel like if Shawn Michaels screws up uh, Brian Pillman Jr., Stone Cold Steve Austin probably will kick his ass. Uh, that's probably why he's not going to screw him up either. <laughs> like, um, I actually think he could do great stuff in NXT, uh, if he gets there in time, he could be the guy that ends up dethroning Carmelo Hayes for the belt. Um, and yeah, I, f I feel like he could just do some really good stuff. I feel like he could be, uh, you know, really good North American champion, really good, like, you know, NXT champion eventually. But how do you think Brian Pillman Jr.? What do you think about being signed? And what do you, how do you think he's going to do in WWE? I think he's going to do great in WWE. I think that they're going to know how to use him. This is, the, this is where I wanted him to be four or five years ago. When he signed with AEW, that's where I wanted him. To, I wanted him to go to WWE because I was watching him in MLW, and I was like, "Damn!" I was like, "I wonder when his contract's up." And he started making appearances in AEW, and then once his MLW contract um, came up, he immediately signed with WWE, AEW. And I was like, "Damn it!" I was like, "That's the that's the person I wanted to sign for for WWE to sign badly back then." Now that he's here, I'm fucking stoked. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of glad in hindsight they didn't because he probably would have been one of the guys that got cut doing those, like, massive releases they were doing in 2021. Um, so it's kind of a, a good thing in hindsight that they didn't uh, sign him. I actually think he signed at the right time because I feel like he might have been... I mean, I know you, I know you don't want to think that because they probably wouldn't have, but they signed a lot... They released a lot of people in 2021. You wouldn't have thought would have gotten released. So it's like, you know, I'm kind of happy that he's, uh, that he's here now. At a perfect time, too, right when there was a hiring freeze and all that type of stuff. So, you know. Another news thing, I think we mentioned it before, but we'll just mention it. Nick Aldis pretty much confirmed that he's in WWE working as a producer. Uh, I'm cool with that, I guess. I would have liked to have seen him, you know, wrestle. Um, be in a wrestler world, just because I still think he could do a lot. You know, especially in WWE, he hasn't really done it there yet type of thing. So I would have liked that. But, you know, maybe he will do a, do a wrestling thing, but maybe he's just done wrestling type of thing. He wants to wrap up his career, but, you know. Uh, good. Uh, that's a big name to get for WWE to get right there. Whoever would have thought he would have been in WWE. He only he talked about how he just wanted to make the NWA a bigger brand, and basically the NWA screwed up at doing that, so uh, he's like, yeah, I'm out of here. But uh, how do you feel about uh, Nick Aldis being in WWE? Um... 
he's a great asset in terms of like producer in that producer role. He's not done wrestling, that's for sure. Yeah, um, he's still fifty days and whatnot. But um, eventually he could get in the ring. But right now, I think he's a huge asset for them in, in terms of being a producer. I mean, it'd be cool if he fought Walter for the belt. You know, that'd be awesome. Like, Walter's yeah. attacking somebody, and then, like, he has to, he comes out to, as, like, the producer, the, the, the typical guys that come out to break it up, and he's the one, and Walter just takes him out or something, and then uh, you build to that match type of thing. Uh, I think that'd be awesome. Um, and then uh, other big news, I think you mentioned this, Tony Khan, not Tony Khan, Nick Khan, um, Pretty much denied that CM Punk is uh, going to WWE. He pretty much says that he doesn't want him there, type of thing. Again, we do have the question: Is that uh, you know uh, them telling us something that we don't know, type of thing? Is that uh, because obviously we've seen that before? But yeah, again, we'll just have to wait and see. We kind of we kind of gave our thoughts earlier when we went off on that tangent. So I don't really think we need to, there's anything to say about it. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean we covered it basically. Um, we covered. It. And then there's reports that Edge has internally been, uh, first it was m- removed from the roster, but then back in the roster. Like, I, we still don't really know what's going on with Edge type of thing. I, yeah. Huh? Because, again, I've seen, I've seen stuff today that's like, according to uh, Wrestling Observer Newsletter, there's still a far, a far apart on money. And I'm like, it's not true. So, yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. Not making shit up. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, because... I know Edge did that video, but there has been times before. I mean, look at his comeback that he had. Like, he, he basically kept saying no, 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 no. So, because that happened, there, there is a chance of that. But, yeah, I think he's going to I think he's gonna end up resigning. I mean, I just don't think they're rushing into stuff because his contract isn't up until, like, the end of September type of thing. Like, they still have a pretty decent amount of time. Type of thing. Yeah, they still have a decent amount of time. I think it's October, I think. Mm. I mean... I would say this, if he's not at full... I would say if we don't see him in AEW by, like, full gear, he's not coming to AEW. I'll just say that. Um, actually, no. I I'll say this. Oh, no, I don't think so either. I'm just saying, like, the, I'm trying to give a time... Like, the time frame for Punk type of thing. Like, I would say, too, I think they're doing a big tour in Canada in December. If he's not at those Canada tour things and he hasn't shown up in WWE, I would say he's not going to AEW type of thing. So, um, Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I definitely think he's finishing... Selfishly, I think I want him to just to stay in WWE just because I don't really know what he can really do in AEW type of thing. Like, I'm just not... Everybody, I think, wants him to go there just so they can have the Edge and Christian Hardy Boys match type of thing. And then I don't really know if you need to do that. No, I've, seen that I, I've seen that a thousand times. Um, I cared about it when they were in their 20s. I do not care about it when they were in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. So, we'll see. Um, and then, uh, I think that's... There's also talks that there might be some changes. I mean, this is back to the merger to presentation in terms of like how they showcase the titles and all that type of stuff. There's possibilities that trios championships might be coming to WWE, which I would be all for type of thing. Especially, too, because they're starting to set up a lot of trios on SmackDown, like, you know, Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits, uh, the Blonde and Brutes. Uh, well, I mean, when they, were, when, when, when they were wrestling, Austin Theory and... Uh, uh, pretty deadly and all that type of stuff. So, you know, it'd be interesting, I guess, but, you know, um, I don't know if you really need to do it. Yeah, I don't know if you really need to do it either. Like, just let up the tag belts because you're going to have to really get, like, a lot of trios going. Plus, I think that's going to, I think Sean will get pissed about it. He'll, be, that's more work for him. He's got to put a bunch of trios together and he'll just break up those trios, like, in a second type of thing, you know. Well, how, how do you think he feels about trios? Do you think he likes trios, or do you think it, do you think he do you think he hates it? I don't think he likes anything. <laughs> um, so they, wait, he likes uh, he likes pushing people. He, no, he, I think that he does like something breaking up tag teams. He does like he. That's what he likes. So he likes breaking up tag teams and force feeding us. Um, Tiffany Stratton. No, he likes force feeding us, and he likes force feeding us uh, storylines that he, I think he likes, but nobody else likes. So. Yes. Um, or force feeding someone that he likes, but nobody else likes. Um, like, he loves force feeding us Kiana James, if you notice. He loves force feeding us Kiana James. And JC oh, Jane. Big- and JC Jane. Yes. Oh, there is one more news related then. So, uh, because we haven't done a show and I forgot. So, Mandy Rose shut out down her, uh, fan site and now it started. It, well, 
it's in the process anyways of starting an OnlyFans account. But somebody asked her if she would be open to coming back to wrestling. And she said that she's open to it. She's like a free agent now and all that type of stuff. Which they act like... She's not. Yeah. Um, I don't think... She's not. She cares about getting naked and getting paid for it. That's the only thing she cares about. Yeah. The only company I think that would take her probably... I mean, I guess AEW would take her, but I think it would be Impact. Because uh, a lot of the Impact stars do OnlyFans and all that type of stuff. Like Deanna Perrazzo and Jordan Grace and stuff. But... Well, at least the thing with them, it seems like they at least want to do wrestling also type of thing. Um, at least for the most part, like, uh, you know, uh, they at least care about wrestling. I feel like Deonna Piazza only did OnlyFans because uh, she just finished, like, school and I think had to pay a ton of money to get a bachelor's degree and all that type of stuff. So she, I think once her loans or whatever played off, she may end up just closing it down type of thing. So, um, you know, it is what it is, but it's like, you know, I feel like, you know, why they, but I, th I feel like they at least like wrestling enough to stick with the wrestling. I don't think Mandy Rose really wants to come back to wrestling type of thing. So it's like, you know, which is whatever, you know. I think the reason we get pissed at Mandy Rose is she pretends she wants to come back. But, you know, she doesn't want to come back. And it's like, you know, um, but whatever. Um, let's do a Scott Steiner math thing. What are the chances you think uh, Scott Steiner math that Mandy Rose is coming back to wrestling? Zero. Oh wow! Not even Scott Steiner would say zero type of thing. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. I think we have we have nothing left to talk about. We got nothing left to say. It's all just uh, it's all uphill from here. Uh, I thought that this went a little long, but you also have to remember we had an extra person on uh, for the first hour or show type of thing. So, um, anything you want to plug or promote before uh, we end off uh, this nice little video right here that we got going on? I, uh, I don't have anything to plug everyone. Oh, no. You don't know what to no do. No pluggage. No. Nothing. You're not even going to plug Collision tonight. That's not good. Um, nope. I, don't, I haven't watched Collision in, like, a month. Yeah. Um, I guess on my end, you could check out, uh, I think it's coming, uh, incoming pretty soon, uh, the TNA Impact, um, retro that James and I did, where we, we reviewed, uh, the episode where the main event Mafia take over. You can check that out. Um... There's a retro coming for uh, Bash of the Beach um, 2000 uh, that, you know, Jane's picked. So there it is. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, there's other stuff coming. We're doing a wrestling rundown. Uh, Jane's will be on it. That's going to be the, uh, that's going to be his, uh, I think, his last video that he does before uh, he stops covering modern wrestling. But then, you know, CM Punk could show up in WWE and then he'll be on here WWE Aftershock so they so we'll see um or I don't know like what could happen what else could happen um WWE could go out of business and he'll be back covering wrestling again so um we'll see um but yeah um that's pretty much it guys uh and we will talk to you guys later since this is being recorded in the past we will talk to you guys in the future podcast has concluded be sure to check out more group discussion as far as WWE content is concerned, and check out more content from For the Win Productions. <laughs>